understand that logistically they're going to be in a position to address us at 7.15 p.m. due to fog. They're assembling to be in the one place. And uh, so really what I'm, I'm seeking, members, is a, a proposer and a seconder to adjourn the meeting until 7.15 p.m. to accommodate. So Paul has proposed and Stephen has seconded. Thank you. Okay, so with that, with that, the meeting is adjourned until 7.15 p.m. Okay, thank you.
for your cooperation in facilitating that brief uh, adjournment. Now, I've had a request, and I'm going to take it after declarations of interest uh, from Councillor O'Coffey on a point of order. But the first thing I want to do is I want to go around the members, group leaders, etc., uh, for apologies. So I'll go tell uh, Corlior Tomas McGear first. Okay, I'll just get used to this again, Tommy. I go to Margaret Cahirly, Neil Sagamari, and Lesh Guilty own group of Hinfi in the knock. I have no apologies from the Sinn Fein group. Okay, thank you. And uh, Councillor Warrington. Thank you, Chair. Uh, again, I'm not aware of any apologies, but I note that uh, Councillor Wilson uh, is not with us. Um, so I will, I'm, I'm sorry, Councillor Irvine. So I will, uh, those two, please, apologies. Thank you. Okay. I'll go to uh, Councillor Robinson. Thank you, Chairman. No apologies from the Democratic Unionist Party. Okay. And I'll go to Councillor Mary Garrity. Okay. Thank, just... thank you. Good evening, Chair. No apologies from the SDLP tonight. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, independents and smaller party leaders, are there any apologies? I don't think there are any apologies to record. Okay, members, thank you for that. Moving on then, are there any declarations of interest, <coughs> members? Um, let us see. I'll go to Councillor Dehan. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, good evening, members and guests. Yes, I just want to put on record, Chair, that I am a member of the Executive Board of the Southwest GP Federation, and I am also Interim Chair of the Western Local Commissioning Group. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Dehip. Councillor Coyle. Um, just to declare an interest as I work for the Trust. Okay, thank you. And uh, Councillor Warrington. Uh, declare an interest as a member of the Local Commissioning Group. Thank you. Okay. And uh, Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to declare an interest as a member of the Local Commissioning Group. Okay, thank you. Councillor Coyle. Uh, declare that I'm an employee of the Trust, but I will be taking part in the meeting. Okay, thanks, John. Okay, now, um, I've had a request then from Councillor O'Coffey uh, for a point of order, and uh, could you please reference, if you didn't mind, Councillor O'Coffey, which point of order? That was in relation to the, uh, the, the deferral of the Council meeting. I wanted to in interject my opposition on the basis that uh, I, I think it's shocking, frankly, that uh, the the members who we're, we've had to wait for 15 minutes were already, uh, many of whom were in this town earlier on this day, given briefings, and they cannot find time to speak with the council. Okay. And moreover, I'm uh, advised that we're going to be, point of order. Well, Donald. moreover, we'll be, our people will be expected to go up to Alton McGalvin for uh, emergency treatment, but these people cannot even come down to Enniskillen to answer okay. questions to democratically. You made your point. I'm advised that it's not a point of order. And... Uh, obviously, we want to maximise use of our time this evening. Now, um, obviously, this is a very, very serious issue we're addressing tonight. Really serious. We all know that. And emotions can run high. But I want to insist that normal courtesies apply with regard to not speaking over other speakers. Members will have three minutes to speak, obviously, in the, in the discussion. But again, in the spirit of fullness of, of, of debate, you know, I personally, as chair, would be of a mind to give a little bit of additional latitude to members, you know, uh, like, like letting you back in if requested, if necessary, a second time for a minute. But uh, I'm trying to be as generous as possible that way because it's very serious. There's 40 councillors. Everybody wants to be heard. Uh, so 25.1, speak through the chair. Now, with that, members, you've got the agenda in front of you. So... Um, I didn't want to diminish any of the three presentations, so I'm going to take them in order, one, two, three, and then we're going to open it up to debate um, and discussion uh, and questions after the three presentations, because, uh, uh, anyway, that's, that's me ruling on that matter. Um, so we're going to receive a presentation from the Western Health and Social Care Trust and the Department of Health regarding emergency surgical services at the Southwest Acute Hospital here in Enniskillen. 
So that's the next item on the agenda. After that, we're going to hear a presentation uh, from the chairman of the executive committee of SOAS, Save Our Acute Services, uh, Reggie Ferguson, Mr. Reggie Ferguson. And then we're going to receive uh, a presentation or a spoken contribution from Professor Varma and uh, thank both uh, for joining us in the chamber. So with that, um, I'm going to hand over now and the Western Health Trust team have joined us, as have the Department of Health officials via WebEx. So um, will I hand over to you straight away then, Mr. Neil Guckian, the Chief Executive Thank of the you. Trust. Thank you, Chairman and members of the Council. I'd uh, just like to outline, can you hear me okay? Can I just check that I, yes. I can be heard okay? Okay, and Neil, you're obviously going to introduce your team, of course you are. Yes, Thank you. of course, yeah. Yep. So basically, uh, I want to start by, okay, I'll, I'll introduce my team first of all. In uh, headquarters in Alton Gavin, I have beside me my Director of Finance, uh, Emer McCauley. Beside Emer, we have Mark Gillespie, who's the Assistant Director Leading on Surgical Review. Beside me, sitting beside me here is Theresa Malloy, my Director of Planning and uh, Service Improvement. On my left is Karen Hargan, my Director of HR, and beside her is Mr. Tom Cassidy, my Director of Social Work and Children's Services. Online, I have Geraldine Mackay, who'll be well known to Council as the Director of Acute Services. I also have uh, Brendan Lavery online, my Medical Director, who'll be taking questions in relation to medical uh, issues. Also, I would like to welcome Professor Mark Taylor from the Department of Health, who is the co-chair of the Regional Review of General Surgery in Northern Ireland. And we also have Dr. Thomas Adele, the Director in, in, in the Department of Health responsible for surgical services and other services. I believe that's, is that, uh, in addition to that, I have uh, Chris Curran and Oliver Kelly from our Communications Department. I think that's the Me trust. Uh, <laughs> and Lisa Brady. <laughs> As well. Lisa Brady, I beg your pardon, Lisa. Yes, I beg your pardon. My <laughs> Director of Disability, Adult Mental Health and Disability Services, Lisa Brady, is also on. So you'll appreciate, Chairman, we have a full team of the, of the, uh, of the Western Health and Social Care Trust here. Neil, uh, I want to start. Neil, can you just confirm? Uh, Donna, Donna, Donna Keenan, my, my, my nursing director as well. I beg your pardon. Uh, Neil, just can you confirm how long you think your presentation is going to take? I would say it'll take between 20 minutes and half an hour. Okay. Is that satisfactory? We can we can go yep. a bit quicker if yep. you wish. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. Let's proceed. Sure. Thank you, Neil. I want to start by outlining our, our approach to the presentation. First of all, I will introduce and make some short statements. Then Geraldine will update Council on our recent proposal approved today by Trust Board and the background to this decision. I will follow up the presentation with a request to Council to support the Trust in, in, its un, in our unceasing uh, efforts to sustain and develop the hospital, particularly regarding an overnight elective care centre. Uh, Professor Taylor will link our decision to the Regional Review of General Surgery and focus particularly on patient outcomes. Uh, and Dr Adele will, from the Department of Health will outline the Department of Health's position in this. Then I and my senior team will answer questions, all questions from Council. Uh, and I'm addressing you today, Chair and Members, as Chief Executive and Accounting Officer of the Western Trust. Ultimately, those job titles mean I am accountable for delivery, for the delivery and sustainability of safe services across the geographical area of the Trust. Despite what has been said in the media, I am proud of the engagement between the Trust and Council. We had a long session on the 18th of October in relation to our concerns on the fragility of emergency general surgical rota within Southwest Acute Hospital. Over three hours, my senior team and I fully answered all questions posed by councillors at some length in an open and honest manner. I would highlight that the Health and Social Care Committee is the established engagement platform between our organisations agreed by council. At the meeting, I highlighted in advance at that time there was a possibility of legal information, governance information and data protection issues that would ordinarily require confidential discussion. This was agreed before the meeting and the chair of the meeting made the decision to go into confidential session. Our attendance here today within a few hours of our trust board meeting is a further indication of our commitment to engage with council, even on very challenging topics. I want to turn my attention to correspondence received by the Trust from Council in recent weeks. Firstly, 
Your letter of 7 November relating to the motion to investigate and actively pursue all available legal avenues to defend locally accessible emergency surgery and acute services at SWA. Geraldine will address the wider acute services element of this in her statement tonight. I want to highlight my difficulties with a statement in your motion. I quote, we further note the absence of any consultation, any quality impact assessment, any rural proofing, or indeed any consideration of the likely adverse impact on public health and human rights of our rural and geographically uh, peripheral population. I am somewhat surprised by the, this comment, given our very detailed briefing with Council on the 18th of October. We have not, until today, have had any propo approved proposal to consult on. As explained in great detail in October, we have been highlighting the fragility of our services, not that we had a proposal to change. Not only do we need a proposal to consult on, we also require ministerial approval or in their absence, permanent secretary approval. We had neither a proposal nor an approval until today. We have, however, attempted to have pre-consultation engagement with many stakeholders, including council, which is seen as best practice. Now that we have a proposal, we will enter into consultation. I hope that our consultation approach includes consideration of the introduction of an overnight elective care centre for Southwest Acute Hospital, which, will be, which we will be looking for support from council on. I reiterate, we will consult as required by our regulations. Professor Taylor will address your concerns regarding public health, which is extremely important given the misinformation being presented in the media and in council. These changes, whilst being disappointing to many at this meeting from both sides, from both the trust and council, including trust reps, will improve outcomes to patients and be safer. I now turn to another letter received by the Trust referring to a motion passed by Council calling for the resignation of the Board of the Trust and for the Department to put the South West Region into special measures. In my 25 years as a Trust Board Director and Chief Executive, I would regard this motion as unprecedented. I remind Council that until today no proposal has been approved and, have, and we have engaged closely with your Health and Social Care Committee. We are dealing with a very difficult situation with regards to emergency general surgery, and we are working our way through this. But I would again highlight, patients will be safer and services better with these changes. I would highlight that such motions attack the structure of health and social care locally and are as damaging to everyone who works in the trust as they are for senior managers. Such a motion can also really hinder us from working together to advocate for services in this area. Next, I would like to address some comments made in pre previous meetings of council and in the media by council members. A councillor recently stated that you've been told by union reps that Alton Gavin has six surgeons who would be more than willing to do road to cover at Southwest Acute Hospital. I will ignore the emotive language used thereafter. I can assure council as accounting officer of this trust, that this is completely false information, and we briefed council on this in October. The union quoted has many thousands of members in health and social care in Northern Ireland, but not one medical member. I and my senior team have met with the general surgeons in Alton Gavin on many, many occasions over the last number of months. I want to start by paying tribute to all our general surgeons in Southwest Acute and Alton Gavin Area Hospital for sustaining our emergency route in Swa in recent years despite very difficult circumstances. Let me outline our general surgical workforce on the Ruta and Alton Gavin. We currently have eight general surgeons on the Ruta. That, however, includes three surgeons who have a specialist role with breast surgery. All other hospitals in Northern Ireland have breast surgeons off the general Ruta to concentrate on their specialism. We are on a phased movement towards that. When you look at the remaining general surgeons, we have five on our rota, not six. I want to again explain to Council the rota commitment for emergency general surgery. It requires residency within 30 minutes of Southwest Acute Hospital. 
you cannot cover Southwest Acute Hospital from Alton McGavin Hospital safely due to the distance and time required. We have two consultant general surgeons who have assisted in the Rota and Southwest Acute Hospital in addition to their on-call commitments in Alton McGavin. This, however, needs careful management and can only be used as a top-up for the core Rota due to the existing on-call commitments in Alton McGavin. It is my understanding that at one in five, Alton McGavin's Rota would be more owners than any other hospital in the region. I note a councillor's comments on TV, and I want to highlight my disappointment in the language used on TV. To describe an elective centre as a glorified hotel is extremely disappointing, bordering insulting to the many staff who deliver elective services within Southwest Acute Hospital and so many other facilities. An overnight elective surgery centre is seen by my senior clinicians as the final piece in our strategy for addressing this issue, particularly if we can have a focus on general surgery, given the rurality of the hospital. Chairman, I will ask Geraldine now to now present on our current position before inviting Professor Taylor and Dr Adele to address council from their prospective positions, and I will offer some concluding remarks. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Neil. Um, so today has um, been a difficult day for, for all of us, including the population of Fermanagh and West Tyrone and our staff at Southwest Acute Hospital. I think um, it's really important that I start tonight by explaining what general surgery is. Um, so there's been some confusion because of the narrative in the media and other outlets. And so I want to describe as we start, what are we talking about? So general surgery is a wide ranging surgical specialty that focuses on mainly disease of the digestive tract. Over the years, most more subspecialism has developed across general surgery, for example, colorectal, upper and lower gastrointestinal surgery. So today um, there is a difficulty in finding, retain, recruiting and retaining a general surgeon who can do everything. And I think that's really important that the council understand that, um, particularly in a rural community. Emergency general surgery relates to the treatment of patients presenting with acute abdominal pain. Um, you'll all be aware of things like appendicitis, bleeding, trauma. In children, the most frequently performed emergency surgeries are appendicectomy and testicular conditions. Elective general surgery or planned surgery means surgery is planned in advance in a very controlled environment as opposed to the emergency or unplanned treatment. Thanks, Chris. Next slide, please. Can we move on the slides? Apologies, Geraldine. It's just it's it seems to be very slow the system and moving on the pages just at the minute. So uh, it ha I have clicked it to move on. Okay. Well, I keep talking, Chair. Um, through the please presentation. Please do, Geraldine. Yeah. Please. Can yeah. Okay. Um, so I suppose the the starting point and the context then after the description of what general surgery is. The context and what we are working with in terms of general surgical services at Southwest Acute Hospital. We are currently funded for 6.5 consultants. We have funding for six middle grades. We also have a number of uh, doctors in training at uh, FY1, FY2, and uh, senior training level. Um, the, the issue around um, general surgery has been around for quite a while. In June 2018, the chief executor, executive and myself were um, attended a meeting that um, was asked. We were asked to by the clinical lead for Southwest Acute uh, Surgery at that time. Um, they outlined issues regarding provision of a compliant rota. We had uh, issues with retaining locum staff, and at that point, we had been um, employing a number of locum staff to to uh, support the rota. 
and it was difficult to, to find locum staff with the appropriate skills or the competence to provide a safe service. Um, the recruitment round at that point in time in June 18 yielded no surgical applicants with endoscopy skills, which is critical for a rural hospital. Um, again, in August 2020, um, we escalated to the Department of Health that the rota had become unsafe and was probably not sustainable in the long term. An early alert was submitted at that time by Dr. Kilgallen, the, the chief executive at the time, to the Health and Social Care Board and the department. The department uh, responded by um, organizing a regional summit in September 2020 um, to, to try and, and find a regional solution to support um, the Southwest Acute Emergency General Surgery Rota. And that has worked to a point, but the difficulty is that surgeons from other trusts come and, and can cover um, the rota, but maybe for a short time at weekends or one day during the week, it is not consistent and it is not a good thing for patients. And the current consultant rota that we have in place is only covered up until the 18th of December. In terms of recruitment, because I believe there's some discussion as well, and I've heard some um, this evening about we have not recruited. So there has been six rounds of recruitment uh, between 2014 and 2021. We have made five consultants appointments in that time. We have um, probably February 2019 was um, our, our, the time that we had the most um, general surgeons in post, and I think we had five at that point in time. Um, however, since February 19, we have lost six consultants. We have lost three to retirement and three others that have resigned and moved on elsewhere. In July 2021, we commenced another round of recruitment and it was delayed for a number of months due to the uh, Royal College of Surgeons approval issues. That round completed in January 2022 with no appointments. We are currently out to recruit. And the reason that we have gone out this time with a generic Western Trust job description is because of all the difficulties we have had in the past with recruiting specific, specifically with a job description for Southwest Acute Hospital. So we decided to try something different this time. Um, so the closing date for that is tomorrow. And um, at this point, we can't, we're not in a position to know how many applicants we have. So in terms of the patient data and how many patients will be affected, so the average general surgical admissions, we've looked at this from 2017-18 um, through to June 2022, and um, you will see that we have on average about 4.3 admissions per day of adult and 0.5 um, under 16. Um, we looked specifically then at the um, the, the COVID year, the pre-pandemic year, 1920. And at that point, we had on average a total of 5.4 admissions per day. So we have we have the number of patients requiring um, emergency surgical admission has, has gone down slightly. So what we're talking about on average is four to five patients per day. And obviously you don't get all those in the one day. We could get six one day and three the next or whatever, but that is the data, and that is what we are working towards in terms of our, our planning. Um, next slide, Chris, please. So the current position is today that out of the 6.5 permanent consultant general surgeon posts required to deliver the out of our service, um, there are three substantive consultants currently in the post. The latest position for those um, consultants is set out below. So as I said, on the 17th of October, 18th of October, um, we received a resignation on Monday, the 3rd of October from one substantive consultant who will leave the trust on the 18th of December. Um, we know and are aware of a, a consultant who is going off on a period of planned absence and cannot work in the unscheduled or the emergency rota from this Monday, the 21st of November, following a risk assessment. And I suppose the the um, 
the latest position is in terms of our final substantive consultant is that a resignation was received from that person on the 8th of November and that person will leave the trust on the 3rd of February 2023. Um, we notified the Department of Health of this current situation and we updated our early alert on the 11th of November. And we went to trust board today and requested um, a temporary unplanned emergency change. And um, although we have a rota in place up to the 18th of December, it is important that we need to temporarily cease from the 4th of December because we need to make arrangements for the current patients who would be in our emergency ward at that time. And we would need to make, we couldn't wait until the 18th of December and then have to move maybe 24 patients in one day or find other arrangements for them. So that is why the 4th of December has become so apparent. We have been working, um, I suppose, in terms since since our last trust board meeting, we have been working on contingency arrangements um, with our partner organisations, um, Southern Trust, um, Alton Galvin colleagues, um, NIAS, and also um, Sligo, because of the, the geography of Fermanagh, there is quite uh, an extensive geography, as, as all you councillors know. So we've been working really hard to make sure that the pathways that we put in place for patients will be safe. Um, in terms of trauma, I have to say that um, and really pay credit to the, the emergency department consultants at Southwest Acute Hospital because they have worked with the trauma network. And I suppose we now can confirm that um, Southwest Acute Hospital will, re will remain a receiving trauma hospital um, for patients. So patients can be brought there and stabilised based on criteria agreed with the co our colleagues in the emergency department. Travel times to Sligo can be less, particularly for areas like Maguire's Bridge and Balik. And um, so we have obviously been talking to them as well. And um, NIAS will have um, opportunity to, to make a decision of where the nearest hospital will be for um, patients in that area. Um, we also have uh, put in place a middle grade surgical rota. And they, they will be on site Monday to Friday between nine to five to support decision making for our colleagues in the emergency department. And we hope to develop ambulatory surgical services alongside our contingency arrangements in the next number of weeks as we go forward. Um, abdominal pain, you will see um, there has been a lot of discussion around abdominal pain, but we believe that patients who self-present to the department will continue to be assessed there, managed with an intra-hospital transfer if required. Um, some patients who present to NIAS with abdominal pain will be bypassed to Atna Galvin or Craig Evan Hospital based on the agreed criteria with those uh, receiving organisations. Um, in terms of upper GI bleeding, patients with active upper GI bleeding will be bypassed to Atna Galvin or Craig Evan Hospital. Um, minor GI bleeding will continue to come to Southwest Acute Hospital. Um, and so the detail of all these protocols will be made public in a robust communication plan to the public over the next number of weeks. Children under five years and under with a surgical emergency. So we we will um, by these patients will be bypassed to the Galvin Hospital or the Sick Children's Hospital in Belfast, depending on what they present with. Children with a head injury will be admitted to Southwest Acute Hospital under the care of the pediatric team at, at SWA. So I think that is a huge um, step forward for, for our uh, pediatric patients. Um, in terms of, of one of the key subspecialties and, and probably one of the services that, that is the majority of our cancer patients being treated currently in Southwest Acute Hospital, the colorectal surgical patients. So all patients requiring colorectal surgery during this period of the temporary change will have their surgery on the Alton Galvin site where they will have the full infrastructure around them to deliver that care. There's been a lot of communication with our GP partners. Um, so patients who have been assessed by a GP that would normally have been referred into Southwest Acute 
they will be referred to McAlvin or Craig Avon, and our, G our GPs will have direct access to ambulatory um, pathways in Altnagalvan as well. And we hope to have some ambulatory work stream in Southwest Acute in the coming weeks as well. So I suppose I've told you about the services and the patients that are affected. So I think it's equally important that I talk about the services that are not affected. So Southwest Acute status as an acute hospital will not change. Obstetric and gynae services are not affected. Acute medical care of the elderly specialties services are not affected. Outpatient services, including general surgery, outpatient will remain on site and are not affected. Elective surgery is not affected. Critical care and intensive care is not affected. Our emergency department will continue to receive and treat more than 90% of their current attendances and our paediatric and cardiology services will continue as is currently. Um, in terms of consultation with our public, um, it's really important at this stage that I say we are very compliant with the Department of Health Circular on change and withdrawal of services. Um, we have been supported in that by our department colleagues. Um, in terms of a public consultation, we plan to go out and consult, I believe, from early January, but Theresa will probably want to come back to this at a point in time. Uh, from early January, um, a full public 12-week consultation on this temporary change. Obviously, there's a lot of pressure on our system at this minute in time, and you'll hear this day and daily in the media. Yeah. And I think it's important that um, we we explain the trust mitigating actions that we've put in place, particularly for the services that remain on site, and um, then for patients who have to travel or be transferred to Alton Galvin in particular. So we have engaged with our Royal College of obstetricians and gynecologists, we brought them in. We asked them to review the service without emergency general surgery on site. And they give us three recommendations what the trust has implemented in full. We also have engaged with, as I said before, our emergency department clinicians or medical clinicians. And um, they're very content that the, the progression of the over, elective overnight stay center will give them some support as well as the middle grade rota being up and running on the Southwest Acute site. Um, we have had, as you've heard today, a letter of policy intent from the Department of Health that the Southwest Acute will be an elective overnight stay centre in the coming weeks and months. Um, at Altna Galvin, we have expanded the ambulatory surgical assessment pathway it will commence fully on Monday, the 21st of November, 2022. And this will offer direct access to a senior doctor consultant initially by phone for advice or booked assessment Monday to Friday, nine to five. It will be available, as I said, for GPs and ED consultants to, to refer patients to. Um, we are also, as I said, planning to um, develop this and expand this in Southwest Acute Hospital. Um, we have uh, agreed to put in place and we're moving to put in place a discharge area within Altony Galvin from the 14th of December to free up beds early in the morning and, and promote early in the day discharge. And we have protected and ring fence beds in Ward 31 to facilitate that inter-hospital transfer so the patients don't have to go from ED to ED, that they will go directly to a bed um, in Altony Galvin if need be. So in terms of next steps, um, robust communication plan now to our staff, first and foremost, and we commenced that this afternoon, the media, our public representatives, and obviously in, to the population of Fermanagh and West Tyrone if, as we go forward. Um, we will progress our plans for our public consultation, and we will also now work with our staff to immediately prepare to progress the, the, the elective care overnight centre at Southwest Acute Hospital. I'm going to hand back now to Neil. I'm not sure if he wants to say anything before Professor Taylor or Dr. Adele come in. 
Thank you. I just invite, Chair. I'll just invite uh, Theresa to say a couple of words about consultation, if that's okay. We, uh, as I said earlier, we are fully committed to consulting on this temporary change, and we will be uh, following departmental guidance in relation to that. Theresa? Thanks very much. Thank you, Neil. Um, Council colleagues, um, this will be a, a temporary change and a consultation on a temporary change, and that is provided for within the department's policy and the circular which is uh, applied by all trusts in these circumstances. Um, we intend uh, and are planning for a full public consultation <clears throat> on that temporary change. Obviously, we are working through now the arrangements for that. Uh, we intend to follow a pre-consultation phase before we enter the, fub the <coughs> public consultation. And um, our intention is that we will have a consultation period of a minimum of 12 weeks. Thanks, Neil. Okay. Uh, Chairman, before I pass over to Professor Taylor, I'd just like to conclude uh, by welcoming this opportunity to now present the trust position and be able to address the concerns of council, uh, public and indeed staff. All our staff within Southwest Acute Hospital will be needed now in the medium and into the longer term. We fully expect to treat more patients as a, revol as a result of these changes in a safer, more effective way with better outcomes. I urge all of you to get behind your local hospital to support our attempts to implement an overnight elective care centre. I met with medical staff on Friday afternoon and the one action that was called for at that meeting was to have the elective care centre status. This seems to have been achieved, however both the Trust and the Region have much work to do to get it up and running. I am happy for Council to focus on that as it has been identified as a key aspiration of the Trust of our clinical medical teams and of our regional review team. I think if we work together, we can make these changes in a safe way and improve outcomes for our population. I believe we are stronger advocates together rather than apart, and I ask you all to support, the, uh, to support, to support us in this. To conclude, I want everyone at this meeting and listening to hear that Southwest Acute Hospital is a thriving, safe hospital with an excellent future and potential into the longer term. And I'll now pass to Professor Taylor to outline some outcomes information. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, members of Council, uh, members of the Western Trust, um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to Council this evening. There is no doubt that uh, there is an awful lot of anxiety uh, in the community at this time. Uh, and one of the things that was behind the review of general surgery was exactly this anxiety. Because if we look to the United Kingdom and Ireland, the position that the Southwest Acute finds itself in at this present time has been only too, too well recognised in many other parts. As we speak tonight, the people of Stranraer do not have an emergency general surgical service. They haven't had for a number of years. Those people have to go to Glasgow or Dumfries. The people of Wick have to travel two hours to Inverness. And the difficulty for every one of us trying to grasp this today is the role of the general surgeon has changed. I see your esteemed Professor Varma in the room, and in Professor Varma's day working in clinical practice, of course, there was the good old fashioned general surgeon. I was one of those people 30 years ago. Unfortunately, we have now developed subspecialization, but the people of Fermanagh benefit from that in terms of cardiac stenting in Alton Galvin or in Belfast when there's an acute MI. The difficulty is that the same thing has happened in general surgery to the point where I would say to each and every one of you today, there is no such a thing as the general surgeon anymore. And the second aspect of that is that in Northern Ireland, as we stand at the present time, 124,000 people are waiting for inpatient or day case elective surgery. And there are centres they are not able to have that carried out in because of the demands of unscheduled care. And the second point, and I've heard an awful lot of um, commentary over the last 24 hours. The second point is that the operation in emergency general surgery is actually now the infrequent rather than the frequent occurrence. 
because interventional radiology has taken over many of the interventions. In the old days, we had no choice but to take out the hot gallbladder. Now a radiologist can put a drain into the gallbladder and that patient does not have an operation. People having surgery by the locum or the occasional surgeon with a perforation of their bowel will have a stoma. In bigger centers with higher volume and specialization, you will not have a stoma. And the third issue is that unfortunately, in many parts of Northern Ireland, the general surgeon has been the caretaker of head injuries, of urine, urinary problems, of ureteric problems. And that is actually an inequality that the people of Northern Ireland are currently facing. In Belfast, a child over the age of 16 will have an adult surgeon and a child under the age of 16 will have a pediatric surgeon. In rural parts of Northern Ireland, any child over the age of five is having an adult surgeon take out their appendix. And these are the facts at the minute that need to be realised. The second is this. Please believe me. I visit the Southwest Acute Hospital. I have the joy as a regional surgeon of having operated in the Southwest Acute Hospital. It has the finest theatre complex in Northern Ireland. And for me, the, the real gem of the Southwest Acute Hospital will be elective surgery. And I can tell you, councillors, today that regional paediatric surgeons want to come and have come to work in SWA, that orthopaedic surgeons are coming to SWA, that my colleagues in general surgery want to come to SWA. And let's look at outcomes, as Neil has said. What are we talking about here in terms of outcomes? We're looking at 20% of the daily admissions actually requiring any form of surgery. So in a, in a day of five patients, that's one person may require surgery. In general surgery, this is not ruptured aneurysms. This is not an acute heart attack. This is sepsis. We measure surgery by hours, not minutes. And the second thing is I heard some commentary tonight about hysterectomies. I would worry if a general surgeon is called to take out the womb in a lady. That is not a general surgical um, situation. So I want to thank everyone today. The learned friends among us, I would counsel that this is a time where we want to build up SWA. And some of the rhetoric that is coming out is actually doing the opposite. Thank you. I'll just ask finally then, Chairman, uh, I'll ask uh, Dr. Thomas Adele to outline the Department of Health position in this regard. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Chair and Council. Um, first, I want to say that trust, the Department's note to the trust decision taken today. And I want to conf just confirm and reassure Council that the decision the trust taken does not change the importance of Southwest Good Hospital or the Department's continued commitment to the hospital or the region. Or the area, and um, that is there, was there yesterday, is there today, and will we'll be there tomorrow. When Minister Swan published a review of general surgery in June 2022, he was very clear that the review was not about closing hospitals. Instead, it was about ensuring that optimum and sustainable care can be provided to all our patients. Given the huge and growing demand for health and social care, we will continue to need every inch of our hospital estate. Every bed is needed, every theatre must be used. The review of general surgery is a positive building block for a wider transformation of health service and implementation to ensure that people across the whole of Northern Ireland, across all our five healthcare trusts who require general surgery, re receive the high quality, sustainable, and equitable care and treatment they need when they need it by the surgeon who is best placed to provide that surgery. The review recognises that a higher standard of care will be delivered by reconfiguration of services and cross organisational working which may result in change in provisions to ensure better patient outcomes. Expansion of the elective care centre model is at heart of the transformation. This model is based on the elective care framework and the drive to make sure we have sustainable and effective elective care services. We already have day procedure centres. We have a very successful day procedure centre in Langham Valley and we're developing a day procedure centre in Oma Hospital. Minister in June 2022 
identified Mater Hospital in Belfast as the first elective overnight stay centre, and um, Daisy Hill as the second overnight stay centre last month. Elective overnight stay centres is a centre where patients will have intermediate complexity surgery and stay overnight. This will include general surgery. The department can confirm that we're working with the trust to develop Southwest Good Hospital as a third elective overnight stay center. This will ensure that surgery will continue in Southwest Good Hospital. General surgeons will come from across Northern Ireland to provide intermediate complexity surgery in some of the best theaters we have in Northern Ireland. That will continue. That will that will happen. This will not this will also be that mean that other specialties will come. This means that we will probably have gyne gynecological service uh, surgery in Southwest Acute. We'll probably see urology coming. We will see more surgeons. We will see more patients using Southwest Acute um, for really good patient outcomes. So the policy intent of the department is very clear. Southwest Acute has a future, has a really bright future. And we note the decision made by the trust today and will support the trust in their um, work to restore services and a consultation and future change. But we also want to make a commitment to the to the trust and to the hospital and um, for an elective overnight stay center. Thank you very much. Apologies, Chairman, we ran over a little bit there, but uh, that's us completed from from our end. Thank you. Thank you for your time. OK, thanks very much. I move now to receive a representation from the chairman of the executive committee of Save Our Acute Services. Mr. Reggie Ferguson. So I'm going to hand over to you, uh, Reggie. I think you're down here, are you? Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman uh, and councillors, for the kind invitation tonight. Just to explain where I'm coming from, I'm the chairman of a group called SOAS, or Save Our Acute Services, which has been set up as a result of a perceived threat to the acute services at SWA and the emergency surgical department in particular. The group, I believe, is non-party political, although it does contain some councillors, and has also drawn support from a wide range of individuals and community groups. Unlike perhaps our friends from the Trust who are, not, are here, at that point I wrote this, I thought the Trust members were going to attend physically, but obviously they haven't. Uh, we have sought the views of the public who are served very well by our local hospital and have organised public meetings in places such as Inniskillen, Garrison, Lisnesky and Derry Gonley. We plan further meetings at Letterbreen, Florence Court, Maguire's Bridge, Rosslay, Arney, Irvinstown, Derry Lynn, Five Mile Town and Cash. And further meet meetings are planned, hopefully in Oma and other throne venues. We wrote to the Chief Executive of the Trust on the 8th of November, and a copy of our letter is available to each of the councillors tonight, if required, and I've left them with uh, Peter over there, I think it is. Uh, this letter sets out our concerns. Um, it is fortunate that there are so many officials uh, from the Trust who are present tonight, again, they thought they would be present, as they are very welcome to attend the forthcoming meetings together or separately, and I have the details if required. Um, unfortunately, we don't trust the trust because we don't have any representation on the trust. The entire board of executive and, and non-executive members, almost all of them, come from the Derry or Altengelvin area. And that's not good for uh, 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 trusting people who are decision makers. And the way that even tonight, instead of coming here physically, that we have had this uh, long range uh, uh, communication from the trust, that, that doesn't really, doesn't breed any confidence. I mean, these are our perceptions. Maybe the trust are working very hard and maybe they are uh, giving the SWA hospital and this area as much attention uh, as, as Alton and Gelvin. But we don't believe that at the moment, unfortunately. And that going forward is something the trust need to address 
and I note that the uh, an advertisement has appeared for the chief exec executive of the trust, uh, which comes vacant next year, and I will be urging as many uh, candidates, uh, suitable candidates from this area, to apply for that job. And that uh, the the uh, closing date is the 9th of December. Um, our group is pleased that our council has been so proactive in condemning the proposals by the. Department of Health and the Western Trust uh, to end emergency sur surgery at SWA. And by dint of that, in our view, deliberately running down other services. I mean, I noted, and obviously, there's been a lot of preparation done by the Trust before tonight. They clearly have this in mind for some period of time. On the 17th of October, they indicated that no decision had yet been taken. But Judging by what I saw tonight, there has been a lot of preparation gone into, a lot of communication, and this was on the cards for a long time. I believe that is true. And it's not good enough for Mr. Gookian to complain and whinge about being criticised by the council because your communication is terrible. You Everything seems to be secretive and behind the scenes, and that's something that you will have to address. Um, we have to say that uh, we we heard the news tonight, and obviously we're just uh, reacting to it, and we'll have to take our own uh, view on it. But I mean, it's not surprising that a couple of surgeons have, in, in, a, in the twenty second of October and the eighth of November, decided to leave because they don't see a future here, you know, and, and that's despite all the representations and all the communication to them by the trust, they just think that there's no future. And why is that? That's something, again, would have to be uh, looked at. Um, and we're disappointed that the chief executive did not reply to our invitation or letter of the 8th of November. OK, we're only a pressure group, but at least we'd have liked to have that the manners for uh, a proper response to that. Um, and the people I live am among are a decent and hardworking people. They live in an area which contains some of the greatest deprivation in Northern Ireland. We have poor roads in this area. We have no dual carriageway. The road to Alton Galvin would make you sick if you weren't sick already. We have no train service, no thriving industrial base, few public service jobs. Mr. Taylor, who I believe is present tonight, I thought he would be here, but obviously, hopefully he's listening to this, was a co-author of the, the Bangoa report, which is apparently all the rage now. It was the latest in about 10 reports on healthcare in Northern Ireland since 2000. He will recall that he wrote on page 14 of the report that males in the most deprived areas live 7.5 years less on average than less deprived areas. Emergency admissions are 74% higher in deprived areas. Action is called for in that report to do more, not less, to improve services for those in greatest needs. I mean, I listened to what the Trust have said about elective surgery. There's no reason why you can't have both elective surgery and emergency surgery at the one base. It's not an either or. Uh, one of the aims of the Bengoa report is to improve the patient experience of care. On page 70, it states that changing the delivery of services is not like flicking a switch. Would you, for heaven's sake, read your own report? We want you, we want you to understand that local people in Fermanagh Throne deserve the same services as anywhere else. We pay the same taxes. We are told by some politicians we are as British as Essex. We are told we are going to benefit from levelling up. I have many relations in England who would not tolerate for a minute the services currently provided here, despite the best efforts of the frontline workers. As I have already indicated, there is no representative from this area in the Trust Board, and as a result, their interests seem to have been ignored. Uh, civil servants are calling the shots. Elected representatives are being ignored. The decision that 
you took today was taken without proper any consultation. And during a time there's no health minister or government, you would never ask people from Belfast or Derry to travel to Fermanagh for emergency surgery. Why, why are we asked to travel to Ottenmagelvin or to Craigavon or to Sligo indeed? There are five acute hospitals in or around Belfast. That is, that is not equal treatment. The people in this area, and I believe the members of the Council have no confidence in the trust officers, we have called for interim special measures to stabilise the position. And we believe that there are ways to improve recruitment and enhance services at SWA. And indeed, perhaps the trust should look at uh, commissioning uh, another uh, recruitment uh, group who, who may do a better job than they're doing at the moment. The Bangor report fails to mention travel time for emergency patients. Who's going to take the blame if a patient dies on the way to Derry or Craigavon when they could have gone to the SWA and lived? That's an important consideration. That's something the Trust have to, have to bear in mind. So thank you, councillors, for hearing me out. Continue with your good work. We, in turn, are given close consideration about what we can do and how we can support you. We won't go away. We will continue to work for the people of this area until what they get, what they're entitled to, a decent health service. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Moving on now to receive a representation from Professor Verma. And which one speaker two is it? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm going to make some observations. I was asked to come to this meeting less than a week ago. I was aware of what was going on on the periphery. Now, for those of you who don't know me, particularly some members of the Trust Board, I was involved in getting the SWA built, much to the objections of my colleagues in Artnagelvin and at that time in Oma. That perception, and it may be a perception, has always been that the SWA was an inappropriate, unnecessary part of the Western Trust. I think that perception probably still holds. And I know for a fact, having worked in the SWA and having worked in the old urn, that whenever we wanted to get anything done, i.e. recruitment of staff, be it physicians or surgeons, there were always, and I sat on many committees of the Western Board and Trust, that there was objections to. There was never a problem about recruiting staff to Art Nagelman, but there was always a problem recruiting staff to Edeskillen of SWA as it is now known. Uh, I'm afraid I have to concur with the last speaker. I would like to know how many members of SWA or how many people in the Western Trust directors, all these various directors that we have currently from human resources, to nursing, to all of these, how many of them come from the Oma Fermanagh area? You know, I would like to know that because I don't know how many. This has been a bone of contention when I was working as a consultant, and I think it's probably still is a bone of contention. Everything is orientated towards Derry and Artnagelvin. And I was told, be this true or not, that a certain senior surgeon in Art McGelvin, and I was only told this by, by a senior consultant, said that if he had his way, he'd close surgical services down in Enniskillen. I was told this by a very reliable source who will remain nameless. So those, these are some observations. The other thing that I would like to know is elective surgery will still continue. Who is going to do it? You know, Geraldine Mackay said elective surgery will still be carried out in, in, in Enniskillen. Well, you need a consultant surgeon to do that. Also, if you're going to do elective surgery, which I think is a laudable idea, I think it would be great for elective surgery to bring down waiting lists, et cetera, to be done in any skill. I have no difficulty with that. Why not kill two birds with one stone? Why not appoint consultant surgeons that can manage the elective surgery that's coming from Belfast or from Newry or from wherever? Because if you're going to do elective surgery, surgeons will have to travel from A to B, that's time, and then go back. 
and then they may have their own work commitment in Belfast or wherever they're coming from. So where's the need to waste manpower by sheer travel when you could have people appointed on site who could do the elective surgery? And we do know that um, people who are critically ill, this is well known, who are critically ill and are transferred, and we are outside the golden hour now if we're talking about emergency surgery. If people are critically ill, the morbidity and the mortality is much, much higher in these people if, if they're not treated at a point where they can receive that treatment. It has been stated, we've got state-of-the-art theaters. Well, why not utilize it? Also, there's been a problem with recruitment. I accept there's a problem with recruitment across these islands. It's not just uh, uh, an, an Iskillin problem. It's a, now, there are areas in Scotland and in England where they've had difficulty in recruiting pay, uh, surgeons. In those instances, what they have done is they have increased the salary. I know there's a salary grade for consultants. So I don't know what the current grades are, but if we take hypothetically that the starting salary for a consultant is 70, 80,000, give them 100,000, give them a three-year contract which ties them down to the base hospital, and it has been shown that after three years, a lot of these people put roots and stay there. That money could be got from all these locums. The Western Trust, and the, the, the hospitals in Northern Ireland, but particularly the Western Trust, has spent more money per head of population on locums than any other part of the United Kingdom, to the best of my knowledge. Why not plow that money into permanent staff? If you make the job attractive, if you make the salary attractive, I know there are regulations, but look at COVID. All the regulations relating to healthcare went out of the window, emergency things were brought in, and it was dealt with. Nobody batted an eyelid. We are in that type of situation here today where the surgical services are compromised. Let's, let's think outside the box. Let's think of making it an incentive for people to come to the hospital to work. Because when people do come here, they find that not only are our schools very good, but we are living in an environment which is less polluted and much more friendlier. But forget about those, those niceties. For Manor and Tyrone cover 25% of the population area of this province. And we're gonna be deprived of acute surgical services. What happens, according to the slide there, obstetrical services and gynecological services are gonna be intact? Fine, very acceptable. The gynecological surgeon goes in, suddenly finds there's a major problem which is not only requiring a gynae person, but also requires a surgeon to be there. What are they gonna phone out the Gelvin? Or phone Craig Avon? And take them the guts of an hour. I mean, I, I break the speed limit, I drive very fast, and even I driving fast can go to Artin Gelvin in just under an hour, and that's avoiding the speed limit. So, you know, I've done that road many times for many meetings, so I know my way. So, you know, in the middle of the night, if there's a gynae problem, which surgeon's gonna come? And, confer, you know, take simple things like endoscopy. The endoscopist is doing his procedure, and we have very good endoscopy in the hospital. He runs into some surgical problem, which can happen, inadvertently perforates, or something goes wrong. Where's the surgeon on site? Ring for him to come from where? So these are just medical observations. I'm not siding with anybody in this. I want to see the hospital maintained. I want to see the services maintained. I want, I think, to have it as an elective center is excellent. But I think, why not have surgeons on site to work with the elective people as well as providing an emergency service and incentivize people to come. If you don't incentivize, and I have a, I mean, again, this is maybe, I think this whole plan has been hatched up between the Department of Health and the Western Trust and Arthur Gelvin. That's my theory. It may be wrong, but that's what I firmly believe in because I've worked in the health service for over 40 years almost all of it in the Western Board. And I know how the Western Board operates from the time when it was a board to now when it was a trust to a management. And to, so I know the thinking, I, at least I, 
I think I know the thinking, and I don't think it's changed. So that's my view, and I'll, I'll say no more, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Right, members, uh, thanks to the three presentations we have received. And uh, we're going to open it up shortly here. Um, as you can imagine, of a significant amount of uh, councillors seeking to, to speak. So I have to go in order of receiving those requests. And uh, it's my intention to go to the chamber first, then WebEx, chamber, then WebEx. But before I do, and my first speaker in the chamber will be uh, Councillor Diana Armstrong, I just want to ask this question of the trust myself as chair of the council. Uh, I want to ask about your description, Neil and team, and uh, your description of this as a temporary emergency change. And my question would be, when and how can this temporary change be reversed? In what circumstances? And can you set out clearly your plans for the restoration of emergency surgical services at the Southwest Acute Hospital? Mark, uh, Mark Taylor wants to come in first before we, we fully <coughs> answer that, Mark. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I listened intently to Professor Varma's commentary, and I should say, firstly, Professor Varma, I am not from the Western Trust. Um, I am uh, here regionally, and I, I do find your commentary interesting. I, I would imagine that you are very much in favour of the cardiac stenting for an acute myocardial infarction um, going to the central two hospitals. Uh, I can't imagine that on the basis of evidence that you would be supporting coming to the Southwest Acute Hospital for thrombolysis rather than stent. Uh, unfortunately, the same is very true with general surgery now. And I, I, I hope I had articulated that we in emergency general surgery now require as much in terms of interventional radiology, we require as much in terms of other support mechanisms and the difficulty at this present time, a difficulty that Southwest faces, many other places face, is that actually colleagues are voting with their feet they will want to work in a unit of one in 10 people with all the adjuncts around them 24 hours a day, and they only want to operate on the left colon. So Pro Professor Pharma, I note your points. I share your passion for the Southwest Acute Hospital, but I think we have got to look at relevant current evidence. Secondly, you talked about patients dying on transfer. Um, all of the recent literature would disprove what you have just said in terms of general surgery. I am more than happy to meet you directly to look at the regional review, but I would counsel you as a learned professional to remember that in general surgery, it is not cardiology. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Now, Neil, can I insist? To answer your question, Chair, Yep, quite, frankly, uh, quite frankly, Chair, we do not know at this stage when we will be reversing the situation from temporary, uh, to the temporary change. I have to be open and honest with Council, as I always have been. We will do a, temp a consultation on this temporary change and we will listen to the public. But we haven't been able to sustain our staffing in the Southwest Acute Hospital and safe pathways are our priority at this time. We must ensure safe services for our population. And we will look at our recurrent recruitment and review it uh, regularly during this period. Thank you. So Neil, is it safe to say then that you don't have a plan for the restoration of emergency surgery services while you're describing this as a temporary emergency change? That's correct because we, we have to continually review our, our staffing. Okay, Councillor Armstrong. Thank you, Chair. This is a dark day, and um, it's a dark day that affects everybody, every man, woman, and child in the Fermanagh and West Tyrone district. We're a rural, uh, rural dispersed district, and we feel marginalised by this decision. 
and I want to say that I'm absolutely disgusted with the decision announced today. And the fact that so many questions remained unanswered is proof that the Western Trust has not been transparent with us. Communication has been woeful. Today, you, you tell us that you are going to start a robust communication plan starting today. Why not earlier? So at the outset, I have one fundamental question for the Trust, and that's whether they can assure us as local representatives that no patients, no matter how small in number, will come to harm as a result of this decision. Specifically, I'd like to ask them to give a commitment that no local patients will lose their life as a result of what's being proposed. I fully accept a majority of emergency surgical patients may ultimately be able to travel the very long distances to either Atna Galvin or Craig Avon if left with no other option. But in a smaller number of instances, that simply will not be the case. Throughout the public debate in recent weeks, I've always sought to use measured language, but now having spent time thinking about the issue, and more importantly, after speaking to clinicians who understand the realities of what is being proposed, I've come to the conclusion that the decision will indeed cost lives. There have been cases in the SWA when urgent surgical intervention was, was critical previously, and there will undoubtedly be cases again in the future. One example I'd like the Trust to respond to specifically is in the event of either the presentation or inpatient onset of severe sepsis. Of course, the first port of call would be the administration of antibiotics, but after talking to experienced clinicians, they stressed to me that in some cases, surgery is also urgently required to remove infected tissue. So what will happen in the event of a swab patient developing severe sepsis and perhaps even reaching the stage of sepsis shock out of hours and with no other surgeon on site when they are at least an hour and a half away from emergency surgery in either Atna Gavin or Craig Avon? In that instance, can the Trust sit here tonight, and I'm disappointed you aren't here in the chamber, can you sit here tonight and give us an assurance that those patients face no higher risk of mortality as a result of emergency surgery not being available locally? Because even if they can, I, but more importantly, other HSC staff simply don't believe them. Finally, Chair, in reaching the decision to end the service, I can only hope and presume the Trust will have carried out detailed modelling on past and future demand. In particular, that they have the information on the acuity of patients requiring emergency general surgery, and therefore the data to demonstrate whether what they are doing is safe or not. I think, Chair, it would be reasonable for a copy of that modelling to be shared with this Council, and therefore I'd like to ask the Trust Chief Executive tonight that he will give a commitment that it will be shared without delay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Needle, please. Response and response, Chair, I will invite uh, firstly uh, Ronan O'Hare, Professor Ronan O'Hare to answer first, and then I'll be uh, uh, inviting my medical director, Brendan Lavery, in relation to the, the safety of services. Thank you. Ronan. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, really uh, addressing a few of the issues, Dan, communication. It wasn't until today we had permission from the Trust Board to go forth. And as Mr. Guckian said, there will be a robust um, communication uh, plan going forward. In relation to uh, patients coming to harm, I refer to the general review of uh, surgery for the region. I refer to Professor Taylor, Taylor's evidence on outcomes. And whilst we all focus on the emergency patients, uh, all the members of council will have people at their clinics complaining about elective surgery and the suffering that those patients are going through. We have to change. We have to change to have a different healthcare system in Northern Ireland. Your next point was in relation to cost, will cost lives. There's no evidence to show that that will happen. Very, very, very few patients need surgery within four hours of presentation. I cannot think uh, of one patient in the last two years that we have taken, that I personally have taken from ED to theatre directly. Um, your points in relation to sepsis, well, that relates to a, a, a treatment plan called Sepsis 6, 
There's a lot of interventions uh, that need to be made within the hour before, to improve the outcome. But most importantly, um, you have to have the right people there at the right time. Uh, in relation to the HSE staff, the detailed modeling, uh, that already exists in the review of general surgery uh, and what's anticipated going forward. But what we fail to address uh, overall is that we don't have any surgeons. They're walking with their feet. And it's, it's me has to sit in front of relatives and explain to them and patients where things have gone wrong. We have had a series of locum surgeons come in. The trust, the trust made a decision not to bring any, in any more locums. And uh, since that date, we have had no serious adverse instances. Before that, we had eight related to 13 locum consultants. Thank okay. you. Okay, I'm going to go now. I'll invite Brendan Lavery to come in as well, just for please. Yeah, no problem. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, a couple of issues I'd like to bring up. So the first issue is really, if you do a literature review, it is very, very clear that there are better clinical outcomes in units that do more operations. There is no ambiguity, no doubt about that. And I think to be fair, the best person on this call who can tell you that is Professor Taylor. Professor Taylor is well-renowned, both within Northern Ireland and across the UK. And there are multiple papers that agree with that. So the idea that what we're going to do is going to harm patients has been proven to be wrong. Okay, so we do have to be very clear about that. Now, there are a couple of things that were brought up. For example, there's use of the term golden hour. Golden hour has nothing to do with general surgery. Golden hour is a term that was used in the 1980s with regard, with regard to trauma care. That has now been superseded by the fact that trauma patients should be seen in units that see significant amount of trauma and also have the backup to look after these patients. So there is no golden hour that has any equivalence whatsoever to general surgery. Moving on to the obstetrics and gynecology that was brought up, we are going to have 24 seven experienced middle grade cover that will be ready to go in and help the obstetric and gynecology team if they're asked. This was one of the asks from the regional uh, representative of the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. We do also have to be aware that that is a very rare ask. Now, a very good and very experienced friend of mine who's just retired as an OBS and gynae consultant, told me she asked for general surgeons to intervene once in her professional career. Okay, now that gives you an idea. I'm not saying that that is typical, but it is something that only happens once in many, many years. And yet, because we were asked, we have put safety protocols in there to ensure that, that is covered. Another issue that we have to get across here, and this is really, really important, this is not a choice. This is not something we decided we'll get up and we're going to take away services from a hospital. In an ideal world, I wish we had surgeons that would work there, that would stay there, that would provide a service, that we wouldn't have to make these changes. Unfortunately, we cannot recruit now, people have come up with multiple suggestions about what we should do. And the honest answer to that is we have tried everything. We've tried international recruitment. We've had multiple locums through the door. We've had multiple rounds of recruitment and we simply cannot recruit. And we have genuinely tried, believe you me, we have tried our best. The surgeons that have only recently left have all tried their best you know, to keep this service going. And I think that I'm going to make one final point, and this is perhaps very, very important because lots of people are making comments about what should happen. But have you noticed not a single general surgeon in the entirety of the UK or the Republic of Ireland, either working or retired, has come out against this? And I think that is a very, very salient point because people who know about general surgery realize both the recruitment issues and also the fact that, that we really, you know, we have to pay tribute to our colleagues that have, have worked above and beyond 
for many, many years. I, I've, I've talked with colleagues down there. They, they initially brought up the fact that the Rota was exceptionally difficult and professionally very, very tiring. It's really been on for the last four or five years and they have tried their best and we have tried our best as well. This is not a place we've come to. The, the idea that simply that we want to withdraw things or there's some conspiracy against the SWA, that is absolutely incorrect. If we had enough surgeons, we would have them there. We don't, so we can't provide that. So what do we have to do? We have to prepare and make mitigations to make sure that it's as safe for patients as we can make it, and also to allow as many patients to be treated on that side as we can. Because remember, we need the SWA. The Western Trust needs SWA. Northern Ireland needs SWA. We need to use every single bed and every single condition that works there. Without that, we will all fall over. And I, you know, I, I, I can put it no more, no more simply than that. We need Southwest Acute Hospital to remain an acute hospital and to see as much and as many patients as we can. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, we might return to the subject of recruitment efforts. You know, for example, a rural incentive scheme has been mentioned, etc. But I, I want to keep the flow going in the meeting here with councillors. So on WebEx, uh, we will have Councillor Green next, and Seamus will be followed by Councillor Roy Crawford, uh, but, but each will get individual answers. Uh, so, Corlior Green, Seamus. Thank you, Chair, and uh, uh, thanks to the Trust for, uh, I was going to say a torn up, but uh, a torn up to their screens up in Derry. Uh, just on that, uh, I was kind of taken aback by uh, Mr. Dutchin's um, uh, approach, uh, almost, uh, for the want of a better word, almost a, a, an aggressive uh, introduction that he gave. You know, as if, as if we in Fermanagh and Oma almost should be thanking and go and be the presentation, even the last one from Brandon there. Almost, it's almost been uh, whitewashed that we should be nearly thanking the Trust for doing what they're doing, that it's going to benefit us. Do, does, do you actually think that the rural people of Fermanagh and Oma are that easily caught? This is a disaster for this area. Again, a rural area being sidelined. And you know, if all of these um, consultants are coming and then retiring or resigning. Surely that's down to you. Surely that is mismanagement. It, uh, it's just, if, if that was any other, if it was a private industry and people were coming to the job and then resigning a week or two later, you'd be looking at the management. You'd be asking what is wrong here. And uh, uh, just, just on that, uh, 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 back to Mr. McGuckian or uh, Mr. Guckian there, can he guarantee 100% that no patient from Pramana or Oma will die because of this change? I want him to say that there's a 100% guarantee that nobody's going to die because of this. Because if even one person dies because of this change, well, then it's down to the mismanagement of the trust, as far as I'm, I'm concerned. Uh, uh, going by the distances, uh, I think it was Brandon there said there's no golden uh, hour anymore. Is he seriously say, uh, trying to uh, say to me that a distance doesn't matter? I looked it up. For every 10 kilometres further that a patient has to travel, there's a 1% increase uh, of of them dying, one percent. So if you take uh, Roslea to Derry, that's an extra sixty seven kilometers to uh, uh, rather than going down the skillings. Uh, to to me, that's almost seven percent increased in death for people in Roslea because of this. So if anyone's trying to cod me, but having to go to Derry isn't. A more life threatening than having to go down and skill for the same uh, procedure. 
the needn't be trying to convince me of that. That's a complete okay. nonsense. And okay. um, final point, Seamus, because you're you're at the three minute mark, please. No, no, I'll just leave it at that. I'll just uh, right. I think I've made the point. Okay, so. thanks very much, Seamus. Uh, Neil. Uh, before I invite uh, Professor Taylor to come in, uh, a couple of things. I think you're you're suggesting that, uh, that I'm saying that uh, I, the council should be thanking us for this. I'm not making in any way making light of how difficult this decision is. However, I feel there's a quantum leap between the trust expressing our concerns on the fragility of a service and immediately calling for trust board to resign. I think there's a quantum leap there. I think we are somewhere in the middle that we are presenting a very difficult case and immediately council jumps in to say we should resign. I think we're trying to act carefully and manage our way through a very difficult situation and also live within the law because we have our own regulations and laws to abide by in terms of consultation and action. But before I say any more, I will pass over to Mark to <coughs> comment. Um, thank you, Neil, and thank you, Seamus. Um, I think one of the other, these are all very, very valid points and, they're, and, and one of the things in terms of the review of general surgery, um, we had a server user group and it was really important through patient client council that we had service users because the expressions that you're um, articulating today are really, really important, Seamus, they absolutely are. And, and we had a critical friend and the critical friend was from Scotland. We also have a group called Get It Right First Time, which is a national group looking at many different areas. And Get It Right First Time in association with what's called the National Emergency Laparotomy Audit. That is an audit of all emergency surgery throughout the United Kingdom. That's about to publish in January, and that's looked at absolutely every centre, including every centre in Northern Ireland, that is producing emergency general surgery. And, and again, the difficulty is, and it is a real difficulty at the present time, is that the general surgeon who was comfortable dealing with all aspects of your care in an emergency setting is no longer there. And therefore, in terms of safety, and the difficulty is, as, as Professor O'Hare said, the locum that comes very, very infrequently. There isn't the consistency of care. They don't, we don't know what subspecialist area they have. In a way, that is the, that is the choice that has been happening at the present time. And colleagues therefore vote with their feet. And they say, I'm a trained general surgeon and I don't want to work in an environment in the emergency setting where I feel really vulnerable. The difference in the elective environment is elective surgery is planned surgery. And as far as possible in planned surgery, you're able to predict the potential outcomes. You're able to go and do what your specialist interest is. And I'll make a plea to you today. I can't wait until I come to Southwest Acute Hospital and do eight gallbladders. That, that, that will be eight patients, irrespective of where they're from in Northern Ireland, of that 120,000 currently on waiting lists. The difficulty is for that small number of emergency general surgical patients, and they are better in the same way as no one on this call is debating an acute heart attack. No one on this call is debating the red helicopter taking you to the Royal Victoria Hospital for major trauma. That is the fact of life now for emergency general surgery. And the public consultation may very well say there needs to be emergency general surgery back into the Southwest Acute Hospital, but it must be with all the standards that anyone else in Northern Ireland gets or should expect. No one should have a second level layer of emergency surgery. It should be emergency surgery that is the same standard wherever you are in Northern Ireland. I want to go to Councillor Roy Crawford next. Thank you, Chair. There are a lot of points being raised tonight, and I hope that no matter how brief the responses will be provided to each and every one, rather than the trust being selective in what they wish to respond to. 
To be clear, in the absence of a minister on my political oversight in the Department of Health, the clear opinion of my party is the thrust, that the Trust do not have any legal authority to have taken this decision. I'd like to quote directly from the Department of Health's policy guidance on the change of removal of services. In paragraph 3, it states the following. There are likely to be occasions when decisions about services preferably arranged by the relevant arm's length body will need to be final approval of the department minister because they are a major or controversial in nature. And under paragraph 18, it states, temporarily changes must not be used either to avoid the requirement of proper engagement and consultation or the necessary impact assessments. Despite the Trust belatedly submitting a very basic change of service request, having spoken to some involved at this time, my understanding is the previous Minister refused to sign off on the proposal until he received assurances from a number of concerns he has raised, responses to which he never had been received. I would be clear to everyone, glancing through the previous legal rulings that with no ministers currently in post, departments are severely limited in what they can sign off on. That includes civil servants, even not being permitted to react to changing circumstances. So my overall question is very clear. On what legal grounds are the Trust taking this decision, specifically having the Department of Health thought DSO advice that they even have the legal theories. So I believe the chair, it may be worth that this council also seeking its own independent legal opinion on this regard. Finally, chair, in order to preempt the likely claims of the trust that all options were explored, can the trust state categorically here tonight to the members on record and in the eyes of the law that is explore that it explored every possible avenue to resource the staffing issues, even on the short-term basis. Specifically, on two proposals that I'd like to trust to respond to are, one, whether they explored the utilization of every established recruitment and retention primary available to trust, and specifically, whether it has offered and whether any applications were submitted and accepted. Secondly, on par with previous elective workforce appeals launched by the Department of Health, whether they explored their own targeted appeal to both current and recently retired surgeons to allow the trust to propagate a temporary surgical rota. I urge the trust to be careful and most okay, of all right. entirely truthful in their responses given to the strong likelihood of legal action in this respect. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Roy, and over to Neil. Okay, uh, in terms of the first comment in relation to the legality of our actions, I will pass over first to Theresa and then to Thomas Adele from the Department of Health to answer that question. Theresa? Sure, thank you, and thank you, Neil. Um, generally, um, within the circular, it is expected that a trust will advise the Department of Health and SPPG of the circumstances of a permanent or temporary change, and they will make a decision on whether it is viewed to be major or controversial. Uh, we preempted that and advised in our correspondence to SPPG that we believed that this temporary change would be viewed to be major or controversial. So we removed any doubt in terms of how this should be considered. There is specific um, content within the, uh, the department's circular in relation to temporary changes. And that content says that the department must be informed in advance of major temporary withdrawals or changes to service provision under the terms of paragraph 15, and that is through SPPG, particularly where these are likely to prove controversial. And we have done that. The circular also says under temporary changes that HSC trusts must secure HSCB 
PHA support for any proposed closures or change of use, whether temporary or permanent. And we have secured support. And I can confirm, we believe, and the advice that we have is that this is legal in terms of the process that we are using. I will now invite uh, Dr. Thomas Adele to address from the Department of Health perspective in relation to that point. Thank you, Neil. Um, as noted, the department has a change or withdrawal of service circular and guidance, and there are clear requirements to consult and seek this approval of final decisions from the department. Such final decision would may require ministerial approval. However, the circular also clearly notes that temporary decisions can be made um, by the trust if that is needed for the safety of patients. And this is one of those cases. In this case, the department must be informed of the decision, and the decision is then for the trust to make after securing support from um, SPPG in the department and the PHA. So in that terms, there's no decision for the department to make. There is no decision for the minister to make. This is a decision for the trust in response to the safety of patients. The department has is fully accepting and fully su supportive of the trust's work to uh, comply with the guidance and fully believe the trust are complying with guidance that the, the trust will consult on the temporary changes and when the consultation is completed will seek department's approval for outcomes if that is required at the end of the consultation thank you chairman i'm going to bring in my medical director because just to go through roy's point in relation to bringing in recently retired doctors uh brandon i know you have, you have strong views on this in relation to emergency general surgery <coughs> Yes, I think it would be exceptionally unwise to put an individual doctor in a position where he would be expected to carry out a complex operation, not having done so for a long period of time. And I certainly would not ever want any patient to, to have to experience that. I've been a consultant in emergency medicine for over 20 years, so I, I do have quite a widespread background. And I'd like to refer to the comments that was made with regards to travel time and increased mortality. And I'd like to categorically state that unfortunately, what the councillor is referring to is increased mortality for medical problems. I'm very happy to post, I'm actually just gonna put them in the chat box. Uh, I did a very quick Google search and the evidence is out there. If you're talking about surgical pathology, the evidence is not there. The evidence is there if you have an MI, if you have respiratory problems, absolutely, your mortality will go up, but not with surgical pathology. And I'll, I'll put a few references in the chat box. Please go ahead and look them up. Uh, Brenton, just on that, um, if you could formally submit that, we would really appreciate it because we use the chat function for technical points and points of order. <laughs> Sorry, apologies for that, Chairman. We will, no, we will no, get that to you. No too. problem. Thanks a million. Okay. Uh, Chairman, I think that last point is extremely important because it's been in the media, it's been in uh, the, the local community an awful lot. I think with my medical director's point there, I really want to emphasize to all councillors and everyone listening and tune, tuning in tonight. Thank you. Okay. I go now to Councillor Dehan. Thank you, Chair. And uh, I want to record my thanks to colleagues from the Trust and from the Department, uh, Professor Taylor, Professor Varma and Mr Ferguson for coming uh, to our meeting tonight, giving us your time. I am certain that uh, this is not an easy day for you any more than it is an easy day for us. Um, I do want to apologise uh, if Mr Guckian felt offended by the tone of some of the motions uh, that were passed uh, in this council. This council, as you know, is a statutory consultee and uh, we, we need to be informed about changes to service provision. That is the role that we fulfil. And I accept that the Trust did keep us informed regarding the fragility of services in the Southwest Acute Ho Hospital in respect of, of emergency surgery. But briefing is not the same as consultation. And uh, we as a council needed to be kept fully appraised of all the developments. Um, 
but I do apologize for any offense caused. But your announcement today did evoke widespread concern and consternation and indeed anger. And even for me personally, and I'm sure for other councillors uh, uh, on this call tonight, it evoked very difficult memories of uh, the time when acute services were removed from the Tyrone County Hospital and the huge public campaign bringing tens of thousands of people out onto the street to save our services. But those services could not be saved because they were deemed to be um, unsafe and unsustainable and who can argue against that no one but what we don't know is what is the safety of removing a service and you know uh, we have had learned colleagues on the call tonight and they have done their best to reassure us uh, about uh, how the safety in the southwest acute hospital will be preserved uh, even when emergency sur surgery is removed. One of the reasons, colleagues, why there is such consternation in the general public is the timing of this announcement. This comes at a time of unprecedented concern regarding the NHS, long waiting lists. We've seen on our screens the pressures on emergency departments. We've heard the tragedies of elderly patients dying in EDs waiting for admissions. We've heard about bed blocking. We also know the backlog. Josephine, can I ask cases. you to conclude your point just for your sake to be effective in your conclusion? Yes, thank you, Chair, and I will do that. My question is this. Um, what are we consulting on? Uh, Mr. Gokian was not able to identify any solutions to this seemingly insoluble problem. What are we consulting on? Secondly, what consultation has there been with GP uh, colleagues, because this will impact on our ability to attract GPs to our crisis stricken primary care services in this council district council area. And what are the pathways for the patients and what additional resources have been provided to the Northern Ireland okay. Ambulance Service? Because we're aware of the crisis okay. that they face. Josephine, thank, thank you very chair. much. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, colleagues. Okay. Neil, can I, can I come back? So Yes, Neil, please. You can return now. We can't hear you, Neil. Aye. Can hear me now? You can hear you now, can you Neil. Can hear me now, sir? Yes, yes, indeed. Can I, can I go back to your first point, Josephine, where you say your statutory consultee uh, and briefing is not the same as consultation? I will go back to my point that I raised at the very start. We have to obey the law. If we are consulting, we need approval from the Department of Health and Minister, well, when there is a minister, and we must have a proposal through our trust board. At the last meeting, when we came to Health and Social Care Committee, we had all we had was an identification of the fragility of a service. So we are now in a situation where you are a consultee and you will be a consultee and we will consult. We will consult on the temporary removal of emergency surgery within, <coughs> uh, within the Southwest Acute Hospital. We hope to include within our consultation the, the adoption of an overnight elective care centre. We, we, we will be discussing that with the Department of Health in the coming days and weeks as part of our consultation in advance of our formal consultation. You, you say about the OMA campaign, and, and that's before my time, Josephine, and I, I, I refuse to be tainted by anything uh, about, about the scars that people uh, still have in relation to the OMA campaign. <coughs> I, that was raised by my staff today when I addressed the, st the staff directly affected by this change today. I, I assured everyone in the room, there is no hidden agenda in this change. We are reacting to an unplanned situation for the trust. It is an unplanned change of services within the Southwest Acute Hospital. You, you, you need not read anything else into this. this uh, you've heard from Professor Taylor, you've heard from Dr. Adele, and you've heard from ourselves. Southwest Acute Hospital has a major future, both with, uh, with locally, within the Western Trust area, and within Northern Ireland area. 
You, you talk about the, the NHS pressures. We are well aware of that, and I hope that Mark's presentation, sorry, Geraldine's presentation has gone some way to outlining how we are trying our best in an extremely difficult situation to mitigate those pressures and mitigate those risks. Uh, I would highlight the, the excellent uh, response times we have in terms of ambulance handovers. We have the best turnaround times in Northern Ireland, and, and that is to be commended, and we will work continually on that. In relation to GPs, uh, Brendan can say if we, if we need to, but we have been discussing with GPs this situation. But remember, this is an unplanned change, which we are now entering into the, the consultation period. In terms of pathways, it's my understanding that Geraldine outlined the pathways for different interventions and different circumstances, uh, uh, which, uh, which will, we will outline to the public in the coming days and weeks. In relation to Northern Ireland Ambulance Service, they have expanded their capacity in response to our proposals and our, our issues, and we are also procuring private ambulances for hospital-to-hospital -hospital transfer to minimise the impact on the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service. It is my uh, uh, aspiration that we do not over-rely on private ambulances. I want to build up the capacity within the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service, our partners, in relation to emergency uh, conveyance of patients. Uh, I believe that uh, but what is the safety of removing a service, the safety implications of removing service? I believe Professor Taylor, Brendan, um, Ronan and Thomas have addressed that, that, that point at this meeting tonight. Chairman, thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Baird. Thank you very much, Chair. And can I say I share the anger already expressed by others in relation to this decision. Uh, Councillor Deehan has to a small degree stolen some of my thunder in relation to Northern Ireland Ambulance Services because it's specifically that that I was going to focus in on. But I think some questions have been answered, but I want to put some specific questions here. And contrary to what's said there, it would it appear pretty obvious that NIAS have effectively ruled themselves out of providing the transport of the patients concerned, as well as a number of local providers, I believe, also ruling themselves out. May be wrong on that, uh, but I'm open to persuasion. So my questions to the Trust tonight are, what exactly is the transportation plan? How are patients going to be safely transported and by whom? How long is it going to take? How much is it going to cost? Noting the well-known pressures on the emergency department, where in the SWA are patients going to be safely kept until transport arrives? And what happens in the event of two or maybe three patients requiring transportation around the same time? It's not good enough to be told it's being worked on. Patients deserve to know what plans have been made. For if there are none, or if the trust are going to try to provide some sort of rush service that will likely fail over the first time it comes under a bit of pressure, it's clear the trust would be acting recklessly by ceasing the emergency general surgery service. On a slightly different note, I like to ask the Trust about the potential for unintended consequences of on other SWA services and staffing. Specifically, whether there have been any other resignations across the SWA site over recent weeks in which the likelihood of the loss of emergency general surgery was a contributing factor. And I'd urge the Trust to be careful in the response, given that we believe this to be the case. And finally, you'll be glad to know, Chair, uh, connected to this, does the Trust believe the loss of emergency surgery, surgery will make it more difficult for the hospital to recruit any of the specific roles or specialties at the SWA? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Over to you, Neil. Okay, in relation to the final point, I can confirm that we have received one resignation from a, a consultant in a South West Acute Hospital. To the best of our knowledge, it is not linked uh, to this, the, these current changes. So I will pass over to, to Mark Gillespie, our Assistant Director Lead for General Surgery, to pick up in relation to transportation of patients. So we've, we've worked along with NIAS in, in terms of some of the arrangements that will be put in place. Um, we're acutely aware of the fact that NIAS are challenged from the point of view of capacity. Um, one of the things that we want to do is minimise the impact on any of that um, work, an important work that Northern Ireland Ambulance do. So at any one point in time, there will be three ambulances um, stationed at Southwest Acute in the immediate term. That is a plan that is already in place with a private provider. Um, so to answer your question in terms of one or two people requiring transfer at any one time, we believe at this point that that is a plan that is robustly in place um, and can be enacted. Um, 
Northern Ireland Dublin Service and private providers as we work our way through this process. Um, there will be almost daily review and conversation um, when we work through this process and when this starts to make sure that we have covered the eventualities. If there is a further risk, then we will go back and explore any other potential options that we need to put in place. Um, we, are, we are open to working with, with the providers to do that. Um, an agreement is already in place in terms of a rota to support that. Okay, I believe, and I believe that's our, our, our answer, Chairman. Okay. Just a supplementary. Are, are you saying that there are three ambulances going to be specifically dedicated and located at the SWA uh, in, as a result of this decision today, specifically for use in those emergencies? We, we are ensuring that there is a belt and braces approach at the outside of this to we can bottom out and make sure that our plans that we have in place are robust. So we will make sure that if there is transport requirements, inter-hospital required, then we will have the facility and the resource to be able to do that. Okay, okay I need to go now till uh, Councillor Fitzgerald, Anne-Marie Fitzgerald, Linda the Hull. Um, yes, um, thank you, and um, you're all welcome. And um, I know it's a very, it's a huge um, subject, and um, there's a lot of people. I suppose they're just, but they're still very angry and disappointed what's going on, and have questions, but not really know the right questions, whatever to ask. And it was just that um, I am an employee for NAS, and I'm not speaking on behalf of them, but it was just that. Um, um, I, th I think you said that you're using private ambulances just enter hospitals. So I'm just wondering, um, just for the, there's a question that's been asked to us especially, but those private amb ambulances, are they able to um, give additional pain relief or any other medical um, aids that needs to happen within that? And, um, and I suppose um, from the onset as well, I just want to commend just all the staff who work down in Southwest Acute Hospital an accident emergency department, the consultants, and the nurses, the doctors, the ancillary staff, everybody's down around there. Um, they do a great work, and especially those who go around and deliver the meals and that there. But they, but they do provide a great service, and um, just onward, I feel like every support should be given to them. Um, they really, really need it, and um, I don't want any scaremongering, but let's just hope that 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 um, they will be well utilised and. Um, well supported throughout this. So basically that's just was, was my one question. Okay, thank you, Anne-Marie. And over to you, Neil. Chairman, I would just invite Mark to answer that. Yeah, so it's a, it's a valid point, um, Anne-Marie, and I suppose from our perspective, um, we will not be putting patients in an ambulance who are unstable and in pain. We would want to make sure that those patients um, are, have the most positive journey and the safest journey uh, between these two hospitals. You're right, um, some of the private providers can't administer pain relief, but where there is a need for somebody to be transferred in an urgent, unstable um, situation, that will be negotiated with NIA's colleagues. Um, so that, that is the position um, that, we currently, that we currently see ourselves. You're right, um, NIA's are key and integral um, to all of what we will be doing as we move forward. Um, and those communication lines will be open, as I said earlier on, on a, on a daily basis with them. Okay. Councillor Warrington. Thank you, Chair. I'll start uh, by saying that uh, I, along with many, are very disappointed that the Trust couldn't appear here tonight in person. And I've heard it mentioned that that's because uh, it's foggy out there and the weather's not great. Well, it's going to be the same for the poor people of Fermanagh and Oma who have to travel quickly uh, to Acne Galvin or to Craig Alvin in an emergency. Regardless of the weather, we're going to have to travel anyway. Um, and I would like to pay tribute to the previous speakers of Professor Varma and Reggie Ferguson. Uh, they made some very good points, and I think Professor Taylor was quite disingenuous to uh, Professor Varma in his comments. Um, he mentioned one specific procedure. I would imagine there's hundreds of procedures we could talk about at this stage. But anyway, today's decision was reprehensible by the Trust, and no matter the number of explanations that are given, it will not excuse the fact patients locally across this district are going to lose out as a result of the failure of the trust management to properly plan. People can make it of it what they wish, but it's pretty obvious to me and many others that the trust vaguely announced an aspiration 
to make this make the swa a new elective uh, overnight centre. It was pretty amateur's attempt to deflect attention. Even the fact that we are a month on with a decision now made on emergency general surgery and there's still been no real substance to the proposal, it shows that it's all very last minute and probably more of a crude fig leaf from the trust. But it is clear, I would think it would be great if it happened. Regional elective overnight centres are, are a bit like the day centre procedures already going on in Oma and Lagan Valley other way forward and we already have the one in, in the SWA that's been carried out by the guys from Musgrave and, and that is working very well and hopefully that will continue. Uh, and But certainly we would like to see that continuing here because obviously it's going to see uh, a decrease in the vast waiting numbers. So I hope I'm wrong in my skepticism of the trust's motivations and timings. That's why I would like to ask tonight for some of that detail to be actively laid out what progress has been in terms of modelling, funding and planning, especially when it is open, it's going to be open importantly to make it more viable, presumably it'll be primary elective centre for the entire trust as well as taking referrals from the region. Because connected to the disasters and frank dangerous decision in my mind to remove emergency general surgery, at least of the SWA was actually a fully fledged elective centre with high volumes throughout and with fully staffed surgical rotas, then at least would offer some degree of surgical cover. And presumably, if, as the trust has indicated, the elective centre would be significant in scale, then there would have to be some sort of overnight surgical cover, therefore offsetting a real vulnerability to local residents of the emergency service to be withdrawn. I would be great. It, it would be shameful, Chair, if the Trust's motivation in vaguely announcing the half-baked idea of the SWA becoming an elective overnight centre was to primarily defect the inevitable public concern and anger on the decision on the emergency okay. general surgery. Thank you, Thanks, uh, Chair. Peter. Okay, and um, Neil? Okay, I'll make one comment at the start and then I'll pass to <coughs> Dr. Adele uh, from, from the Department of Health to talk about the, the overall uh, uh, centres. Uh, you're saying it's, it's, uh, you, uh, how disappointed you are we're not present at the meeting. I notice in front of me there are 36 attendees who are remote. So I, don't <coughs> I was informed before this meeting there was a mix between people attending in person and attending by, by uh, WebEx. So it was my understanding it was a flexible approach to this meeting. I personally think, given that my, my senior team have spent eight hours in Southwest Acute today, I felt it was entirely appropriate that they be allowed to return uh, to either their home or, or to the headquarters here where we're based. So I, I still defend that decision. We will have face-to-face -face meetings with council, I can assure you, but most of our meetings have been uh, by, by WebEx. And I think that's entirely appropriate in these circumstances. But I will, I'll pass over to Tomas to, to, to feedback in relation to the centres. Thank you very much, Neil. First of all, can I just apologise for not being a person as well? Um, I have a four-month-old baby and I'm a primary carer for the baby's mum. And I was not unable to find alternative arrangements tonight, so I can only apologise I couldn't attend in person. Um, I want to spay, talk a little bit about elective organised day centres. This is part of a wider plan to provide a better elective care for our patients across the whole of Northern Ireland. This, this is not a new idea, this is part of our elective care framework to develop day procedure centres, elective overnight stay centres and specialist uh, hubs for really complex surgery. We have the day procedure centre in Lagan Valley, which is, a, which is a real success, showing that the model really works. And we have a really good start on a day procedure centre in Oma. I mean, I mean, we had full credit to the staff in Oma Hospital and to Western Trust for implementing that over, over the last few months. It's been a really good example how it will work for day procedures. The next step on the journey has always been elective overnight stay centres. Minister announced MATER as an elective overnight stay centre in June when it published Review of General Surgery. At that point, the MATER was ready to go um, to, to start up this, this kind of surgery quickly as a result of changes that happened in Belfast as a result of the, the pandemic. In October, Minister announced Daisy Hill 
as the next elective overnight stay center. At the same time, Minister made it very clear that Southwest Acute Hospital was the next phase of that as a third center. So this announcement, or th th what we're saying today, the commitment to make S Southwest Acute an elective overnight stay center, it's not it's not a new thing. It's something that's been in the making for for, for over a year, and it's something we've been working with the trusts for quite quite some time as part of the wider work across the region to create regional, better regional services. We know that this works in Southwest Acute Hospital, and that's why we're excited to do that. Sure. Um, and we will be meeting with the trust and others and all other trust as early as Monday to discuss next steps for how we're doing this. So this is not a new thing. This is an ongoing plan for providing better services for our whole population. Thank you. And I believe Mark want to come in and say a few things about this as well. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. And I also apologize for not being there in person. Uh, we were in the Southwest Acute Hospital on Tuesday. Uh, unfortunately, this is Pancreatic Cancer Awareness Day um, and uh, clearly something extremely close to my heart. We've had a number of events today around pancreatic cancer. Um, our learned colleague, um, the counsellor that was speaking, actually um, really summed up extremely well um, our vision of the overnight stay centres. And I think um, just to follow on from what Thomas was saying, for me, what is really critical in the definition of a hospital such as the Southwest Acute Hospital is what happens if we know there is an ED department, we know there is uh, medical takes, we know there is a wide variety of specialties that take place within a building called hospital. And the hope for the overnight stay centres is that we need really major elective surgery and there will need to be the provision when you have elective surgery to deal with all outcomes of that elective surgery 24 seven, the case of the patient who bleeds that needs to go back to theater. And so the real benefit of the overnight stay centers is that that elective surgery will have a surgical presence that will be there to provide advice to the other medical um, specialties, will be there to provide advice to the emergency department. And I think it's really important to say that there are two processes here. I am sure that it has been clear. There is the unplanned change that the Western Trusts have needed to bring about because of a manpower crisis. And there is the regional and local reviews of general surgery. And the Regional Review of General Surgery is working towards uh, a model where every hospital in Northern Ireland will be actively involved in the delivery of general surgery, whether that be an emergency centre or an elective centre. But the elective centre will still have a major surgical predominance on its site to allow those other interdependencies to carry on and my own hospital the matter hospital since the announcement of overnight stay center has now for the first time in 20 years got the security that it needed because it was always the worry that it was going to be run down it now has a security that it will be needed for many many years to come given our horrendous waiting lists thank you Victor, very briefly. A quick supplementary, just well, certainly I know everybody here will be looking forward to to uh, how the elective surgery is going to be introduced. And I would say respectfully to Mr. Gukian, uh, yes, we have been meeting online uh, on WebEx the last two and a half years, but we were the first council to basically open our chamber completely again, while at the same time leaving others the choice if they weren't comfortable in coming in to a crowded chamber again that they could come online and and do the meetings via webex so thank you chair okay and just to supplement what you've said um it is indeed a hybrid meeting victor councillor warrington as you describe um 17 councillors present in the town hall and uh, relevant officers local journalists professor varma reggie ferguson and a public gallery so we'll leave it at that we're, we're going to move on now to Councillor Bernice Swift.
and I want to start by thanking uh, WHSCT, the team, and uh, the professionals in from DOH, uh, Dr. Varma and Reggie. And I've certainly been enlightened listening to you all. And I too share the concerns, uh, obviously, of all my rural constituents who I represent as uh, it being obviously a priority today for us all. And I'm still very committed as i've said neil in the past at our subcommittee meetings to collaboratively work together to make sure that we do have all our services as needed where it is to be situated at SWA, and we categorically want that to happen it is wholly unfortunate and with great disappointment that we do hear the news today but we want to move forward from here very positively and with a great look to the future and i uh, embrace all the information that was given here tonight on the slides and you know the first point i would make is that's wonderful facts and information to be provided with and i hope that everybody's listening in can make their own minds up on the same facts and deliberations and to that end, I would ask and encourage uh, Neil and the communications team, do you have any plans to immediately go out and speak as we have been to the public to hear the concerns? And indeed, it's an opportunity to quell the misinformation and to be able to present people with the assurances that we will be well because it was one of the questions actually uh, uh, to Dr. Brendan that I had as having watched the news this evening. Uh, when you had mentioned about the patients, you know, the, the four to five um, daily that just may be impacted with difficulties. What difficulties exactly are we talking here? You know, and the question was asked by a member earlier on, you know, can we give the guarantee that we are not going to hear of one death? Can we can we say that safely? Can we say that? And uh, I think I think the public want to hear that assurance, want to hear that guarantee. I do bear in mind that it is a sign of the times when you're talking about the elective overnight and all of that. That's that's clearly understood. And Ronan has made all the additional points and the salient points to explain that clearly to us. But once again, I do talk about the communication needing to be robust and it needs to be clear and understood. Uh, the points have been made uh, again about Fermanagh being a lovely place and why wouldn't people want to come here? So to that end, uh, Geraldine, I want to ask on your report earlier on this evening, very clear and everything else, but to fill in the gaps, please, Geraldine, for people who are listening in on the incentivization. I think Dr. Varma touched on the point there earlier on. I think that would be very useful just to say exactly you know, where the pitfalls are. Why is it that people, I know the point was made, they will vote with their feet, they will, may go elsewhere for various reasons, but what really are the difficulties um, in some of the incentivizes? Is, is, is it, right? Is it not enough that we're paying or what, what really are the problems? But uh, thanks very much for uh, all the robust data. I would certainly like to uh, believe it all, Professor Taylor, as you've said, uh, be believe in you. We're, we're trying our, our very best. I remain supportive. Uh, thank you, Cahirlock. But we want okay. to our services for our rural constituents. Okay, Neil, please. Okay, the first point, uh, just yes, we have a communications plan. It's been extremely difficult to communicate until now because we didn't have a proposal to communicate. We will be entering into pre-consultation engagement in the coming weeks. Our comms plan will, will cover the first three weeks and then we will erupt into, into further, further plans. Uh, in terms of uh, filling in the gaps, in terms of incentivization, this is not just about money. Bernice, I want to reassure you on that. You know, offering consultants... Uh, a slightly higher salary, you know, will not attract the, the staff that we are looking to attract. Uh, Mark has explained that, Brendan has explained that, and Ronan has explained that. In terms of the need for sub-specialization, the need to attract general surgeons in the old <laughs> style, which are just not there anymore. We are trying to go out now with trust-wide contracts and hope that people will be attracted to the wonderful area of Fermanagh and West Tyrone, as well as the wonderful area of the Northwest. So I'm hoping we'll attract people to the West 
so that they will do some of their work in, in Southwest Acute and some of their work in Alton and Gavin to attract people who can specialise in Alton and Gavin for some specialties, but can <coughs> work in the core in Southwest Acute as well. And you know, our, our, our current recruitment may not be successful or may be successful. We will know shortly in regards to that. Uh, uh, in terms of not give a uh, guarantee of us not one death, I will go back to the previous. I am not a clinician, Bernice. What I say does not count in this. It is the clinicians with the research and the necessary skills to answer that question. And I will go back to what Mark has said, what Brendan has said, and what Ronan has said. They are our clinical teams, and they have been able to show you the research is there to prove that this, this is a safe way of working, and, uh, and patients will be looked after and kept safe. I think that's most. And I do conclude by saying I recognise wholeheartedly that you are looking to collaborate with us and work with us, and it's very much appreciated, everyone in Council working with us through this very difficult period. Okay, thank you. Sorry, can I just ask something? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, can you ask me directly a question? Yes. Um, so I want I just want to say that I have spoken at length, Bernice, to the the clinicians who have left and those that will leave in the future. And the two reasons that they quote to me personally about why they believe they can't continue is they want to work in a bigger team with the complete infrastructure around them who's, who will support their decision making. Um, they, they do not want to work in isolation in a one in five or a one in four or a one in six rota. And Neil has already alluded to the rota at Alvin and five consultants there. And I think they probably feel exactly the same. I want to just mention that a question earlier was around retired consultants. I also, when we we were trying our best to stabilise and maintain this rota, I rang the most recent retired consultants to return to the site and support us. And they said exactly, the one particularly, one of them said exactly what Brendan said. They could not put themselves in that position in the middle of the night, having been out of it for 18 months or a year, that they did not feel that they could do that. Um, we did get one consultant who comes in and helps us on an ad hoc basis, but not consistently. Thank okay. you, Chair. Thank you and very I much. Might, just to have one very quick comment on that, maybe as well, if that's possible. <coughs> Anything yep. you want to add? Yep. No. Just really, in relation, yeah, just really a couple of things, for, or Councillor Swift, really. Um, the money's not an issue uh, because they can go down south and have a huge start in salary compared to here. And consultants in Belfast are already doing that. Um, in relation to the assurances and, and guarantees of patient safety, I, no, no one can give you that commitment. No one can give you that clinical commitment. But what we can say, based on the evidence, is that patients will have a better outcome. Um, and lastly, um, uh, the surgeons... You know, very few surgeons retire in good health at the age of 60. I have only one consultant in the last 11 years has reti retired in good, he good health before the years of 60. And those years from sort of 55 to 60 take a huge impact on their health. Um, and most of that is because of professional isol isolation uh, and working alone and working on difficult rotas. And, you know, they don't make surgeons like they used to. They don't make cardiologists like they used to, in my opinion. And uh, we have to change with the times. And just lastly, in relation to Victor Warrington's point, I just list out the number of specialties that we have brought in to theatres in the Southwest Acute. We have brought in renal surgery, gynae oncology surgery, uh, general uh, obesity surgery, pediatric general surgery, uh, orthopedic surgery, and spinal surgery. That has all happened in the last five years. Okay, Ronan, thank you. Now, members, considerable number of speakers, but I want to maintain this commitment of giving everybody the individual chance to be responded to individually. I presume that's what members want. You don't want me to group them. I'm looking to members who are in the queue. Okay. Um, okay, moving next to Councillor Debbie Coyle.
Yeah. Thanks, Chair. Sorry. Um, yeah, first of all, I'd like to um, thank everybody for their presentations, everybody present and the trust and um, everybody um, in the chamber and who is online as well. <clears throat> and thanks to Stevie McCann, my party colleague who proposed tonight's meeting because it's um, obviously very important. Um, I just want to, most people um, that have already spoken before me have um, raised um, some of the issues that I wanted to raise, and I'm not going to waste time by repeating them. Um, I just wrote down one um, thing from Anne-Marie around the ambulance um, service, though, and I'm certainly not an expert, but I'm guessing that anybody with um, that's needing emergency surgery will actually be in pain. Um, and I know anybody in my own, my own family, including um, my grandson that was rushed to um, Belfast was certainly in a lot of pain. And I just want to mention a couple of things that the members of the public have contacted me about um, as, as a counsellor. So one of the things is around C-sections and that are generally planned. However, there are emergencies and when things are not going right in childbirth, in these cases, what will happen as it will leave the woman and child in vulnerable, but also dangerous situa situation where every second, never mind hour, will count. There are concerns, everybody, whether it's scaremongering or not, um, there are real concerns um, in the hospital and out in the public around our um, emergency department and the impact of them. Um, and regarding staff, you know, fair enough people, maybe it's not an issue of money, but is it an issue about um, receiving permanent contracts, you know, so that people can settle and buy a home? Um, regarding communication, um, I did put in a um, thing of interest at the beginning because I do work for the trust and I love my job in the hospital um, and I've worked in ED many times, but and I know there was a meeting today, but it was a very small number of people that kind of attended. So I think communication to the public, but also information to the staff needs to get to get out as soon as possible. And my other concern, well, my concern and other people's concerns is based on what we've heard tonight. Um, will the hospitals, the, the ambulance, how are the other hospitals going to be able to free up beds for patients coming in for um, emergency? How is, that, how is that being planned? And one of the things that I was asked outside, outside um, the town hall tonight, there was um, up to 100 people or more there. And one of the questions out there, um, somebody asked me to ask, was this always the plan for the Southwest Acute Hospital with regard to elective surgery? Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Over to you, Neil. Okay, a number of questions there. First of all, in terms of permanent contracts, I can assure you, uh, Councillor Coy, that there's nothing to do with con per permanent contracts. All our consultants were offered permanent contracts, and yet when we go out to recruit, it's for permanent consultants, not not uh, temporary. So yes, they, they, they've been offered those, and yet the posts are simply not attractive to people. Uh, communication with staff, I, I hear, hereby commit to communicating with our staff. We met with a group of staff, you're right, but those most directly affected today, so they could hear it first from me and my senior team, rather than hearing it on the media or through, <coughs> through other people. So to me, I have committed today to speaking to, to but I've spoken to those staff and we have a series of staff engagements in the, in the coming days, starting at 10.30 tomorrow. Uh, for, uh, in terms of uh, how will other hospitals free up beds? You know, uh, it's fair to say that Southwest Acute Hospital uh, is is pressured in terms of beds every bit as much as other hospitals. Geraldine has presented in relation to the mitigating uh, actions that we're taking to free up beds in Alton Galvin to to to, uh, to address this by way of discharge lounge to improve flow by way of uh, a dedicated bed in Ward 31 and an bringing in ambulatory uh, services. Uh, in relation to the C sections, I will look to my to my two directors to, to, to comment on this. Firstly, I will ask Geraldine to comment in relation to C sections. Secondly, I will, I will ask Brendan from a medical perspective to speak to that as well, because this is extremely important. Geraldine? 
Yes, thank you, Neil. Emergency cesarean sections are carried out by obstetricians and not general surgeons. And I, I'm not sure if that's what you meant by your question, Councillor Coyle, but there is no change to the um, access for obstetricians to theatres to um, carry out an emergency cesarean section. Um, I think earlier on we talked about in the one occasion or the rare occasion where something might go wrong in a cesarean section and they need surgical opinion. And I believe Brendan has that in hand. So, Brendan, I'm going to hand over to you for that. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, I, th I think I'll actually quote the clinical lead in obstetrics and gynecology when we had a meeting on Friday and his direct words were obstetrics is not a problem. Now, there may well be issues that we're going to have to change what we do around some of the complex gynae surgery, but as per the clinical lead and with the mitigations that we have, there is no evidence that we're going to have any problems with emergency or elective caesarean sections. Now, you did bring up a very valid point about communication. And I think part of the problem is trying to get across the constraints that we were working in within the legal frameworks. We do need to get out to the public and tell them exactly what's happening and exactly where they need to attend. That is a duty for the trust. And that is something that we have to do. And that's something we have to do very well. A lot of people don't realize that patients already preferentially choose where they go. My daytime job, I worked in the emergency department at Alt Galvin Hospital, and we frequently would have patients who would travel from Enniskillen with chest pain if they had cardiac stenting in place. That's because they realized that their risk because of the stents is much higher than other patients with chest pain. So patients know where they should go, but we need to give them the correct information to allow them to make educated choices. And that's one of our duties. And it's something that from tomorrow, we really need to get on top of. Okay, thank you. Councillor Bell. Can I, just, can I just answer the final question, Chair? Yes, please? of course, Neil. Yep. Was, this always, was this always the plan? I can assure you, oh, everyone at this meeting today, <laughs> there's no hidden agenda here. There's no oh, uh, conspiracy in relation to Southwest Acute Hospital. There's a recurring theme over some que answers or some questions today. I'm in post now, I think it's 15, 16 months. So I, I am not involved in the history of, 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 of the difficulties around Oma Hospital. I can assure everyone on this call today, we are reacting to a situation regarding particular team within Southwest Acute Hospital. And we believe we've taken every good mitigation to protect patients, to protect the hospital, and to protect the future for, for, for the local population. Okay. Just checking my WebEx here. Um, Councillor Bell, you're still seeking to come in at this point? Uh, yes, Chair, and thank you. Thank you. Um, um, just bearing in mind the last comments made <laughs> by Neil there, um, I, I was speaking to an individual who worked um, and that helped over overseeing the closure of Oma Hospital. And we, we talk about the trust quite a lot. And the term they used to describe Elton Galvin Hospital was predatory. And they were of the opinion that the Western Trust exists to defend Elton and Galvin Hospital. Um, so I, I just wanted to agree with some of the comments made uh, by Professor Varma there. Um, but I wanted to also come back to this point on the legality of the decision. Because as you highlighted there at the beginning, Chair, um, that there is no plan uh, to reinst or to reverse this decision, which which confuses me why it's being described as a temporary decision. And if it's being, if, and if it's not a temporary decision, then it's a permanent decision. And then that uh, makes me uh, join my uh, colleague, Councillor Crawford, in his point about the legality of this decision. Um, lastly, then there was a conversation around the ambulances earlier, and I just wanted to, to bring it back up uh, and basically highlight that if all three of the ambulances are out in the Galvin or Craig Alvin, and there's a long wait time, or if they're still on the road, then does that not compromise um, the availability back at SWA? And then lastly, where are these ambulances actually coming from? Um, the, uh, Councillor Baird often uses the adage, robbing Peter to paying Paul. Uh, thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks very much, Matt. Uh, Chair, I, I believe we've already answered, in terms of the legality of our position, I think we've already answered that, Chair. Uh, yep. we, we believe it's totally illegal. Uh, totally legal approach. 
in relation to the closure of uh, to describe uh, uh, out the Gavin as predatory, I will go back to something that Professor Varma said to us uh, in terms of he suggests that there are no there's no problems in recruiting uh, medical posts to out the Gavin. Well, since I've come into the trust, I'm actually surprised at the at the low levels of medical staffing in Alton Galvin, just as much as I'm surprised in the staffing within Southwest Acute Hospital. Quite frankly, West of the Ban has not had the investment in medical staffing that it should have had over the last two decades. And I've raised that with the Permanent Secretary, I've raised it with directors in the department, and I've asked my team to look at that and see how we can make our posts more attractive from a rota perspective within, within available resources. However, we may well need support from the region in that. Uh, in relation to uh, uh, the, the, the issue of, of, of transfers and, and getting access and uh, through, through uh, delays and ambulances, you, I will go back to Geraldine's presentation whereby we said in certain, and, uh, we will be trying wherever possible to bring people straight to a bed within at the Gavin Hospital, not through the emergency department. So people will not be delayed in that relation and, and that uh, issue. So thank you, Chair. Okay, back to the Chamber, Councillor Gannon. Thank you, Chair. Uh, finally, the Trust today are speaking publicly uh, about this. And even though some of the board has, has been stated already, we're in Enniskill in the day, uh, uh, not one of them even stayed to face us. I know there's reasons for this, but I do find this disappointing, as did the many people gathered outside Town Hall tonight, the very people whose lives are being endangered with this reckless decision on emergency surgery today. It's already been said that we had a delay within this meeting due to fog to accommodate the trust. I hope this isn't lost on them. And I hope delays due to fog don't lead to deaths due to this ridiculous decision. And after denial and denial that anything would happen, no decision was made, the trust insisted, uh, at least four times the last month, it's clear it already was. Don't take us for fools. You knew what was going on. Don't mislead us here. The trust are accusing others of misinformation. And I would say that they have been the ones misleading people. There has been a serious lack of honesty and transparency from the trust regarding this, especially given tonight's the first public discussion on it, given all the coverage already. And an elective care centre is great, but let's be clear, it's a total smokescreen to distract from the emergency surgical closure. Elective isn't the concern tonight. It's not our concern tonight. That's not why we wanted to meet with the trust tonight. Emergency situations are, so stop trying to change the subject. And it should not be part of any consultation. And I would hope the trust would not try to ram it in as part of any consultation. And there's been an attempt to downplay the numbers here. Uh, four to five uh, admissions a day. Approximately, that's approximately 1,800 people a year. Do they not count? Are the trust willing to put those people's lives on the line? But I have a number of questions to ask, Chair. Uh, and I will ask these. And uh, I'll try to get through them as quick as I can. So the chief executive of the trust said the rota surgeons need residency within 30 minutes. I believe the SWA has accommodation available for staff, so it's a moot point for Mr. Duckian and is totally ir irrelevant. He mentioned they had met surgeons in Alton and Galvin regularly. Has he asked them, would you be willing to cover on a rota basis until this service is stabilised? And can we see the minutes in the, of the meeting stating that this has been asked? Why has the use of regional rota based contracts which were used in 2020, not being considered to stabilize this service? And do the trust have any evidence that they even explored this option and that they fully explored this option? Have rural pay incentives, as has been mentioned uh, so well by Professor Varma, been considered to improve recruitment and retention? And can I see the minutes of the trust board meeting where this was discussed, if so? He stated multiple times, that recruitment has been going on the last month. In your, all your statements, you said recruitment was going on. But posts, four posts recently, were not advertised for only Alton and Galvin. They said they were based on Alton and Galvin for only elective surgeries in Enniskillen. Why have you stated that you are um, advertising for positions in Enniskillen when you are not? And don't use the excuse of Alton and Galvin as more attractive because it clearly states elective only in Enniskillen. Thank you, Adam. Can I ask two final questions, Chair, uh, regarding would any withdrawal of the emergency surgical services from Southwest Acute Hospital be likely to have an adverse impact on any of the nine equality groups identified 
under Section 75 of the 1998 Act. And my last question, Chair, and there's a few I've missed, unfortunately, but Mr. Guckian said that he is responsible for the de delivery of services. Will you, Mr. Guckian, here tonight take full responsibility for any deaths that could be caused by this decision? Thank you, Chair. Okay, Neil. Okay, there's very many wide-ranging questions there. So first of all, the, in terms of the rota and the residency within 30 minutes, I wasn't talking about finding somewhere for people to live. I'm talking about you can't stay and reside in two places at the one time. So people who are working the rota up here, it isn't, I've said it would not be safe for five surgeons to cover two rotas. And after, I, I would look to all the different doctors on the call tonight to actually confirm to me whether that it would be appropriate for five general surgeons to cover two rotas one hour and a half apart. You know, so it's my understanding that, that would not be classified as a safe rota by any independent body. In terms of real pay, pay incentives, you know, that has been raised, but I will go back to Geraldine's comments. That is, not, that is not the reason why people are not applying or people are resigning. So that, you know, it's a red, we believe it's a red herring, but we will continue to explore that. And we would obviously, we work within national terms and conditions and we will continue to work within those national terms and conditions. And should that be an option for us to attract additional staff, we will consider that as well. So for posts of advertising, we have explained at some length tonight in relation to the post we are advertising, we have consistently gone out and not recruited to the emergency rota in Southwest Acute Hospital. This is our attempt to do something different, to attract staff to the West. It remains to be seen whether even that will be successful. In terms of, sh uh, it should not be part of a, of a consultation in terms of the, uh, the, the, the elective care centres. I don't think it's a smokescreen in any way. And my senior clinicians do not believe that it's a smokescreen. I met with all medical staff on Friday and they said, their one issue that they would wish to see at this time is an elective care centre, an overnight elective care centre. And that is why we're, we've been progressing that this week so quickly. I personally don't, don't agree with you. I, I respect your position. Uh, however, I do, not believe we've been, I, I do not believe there's been a lack of honesty from this trust. We have not tried to mislead anyone. We have simply identified the fragility of our service and now we're going forward with a proposal to address that fragility. We need to have pre-consultation engagement with our partner organisations so that we can have safe pathways for patients. Not all of our pathways are within the gift of the Western Trust. We need to engage with the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service, with the Southern Trust, to start to a degree with Sligo General Hospital and to with, with a range of other partners. Uh, in times of... Uh, we, I, I believe we've already addressed the issue of deaths. Chairman, sure. uh, time and again, I'm, I'm looking to my clinical colleagues, they've time and time again tonight, they've stated that outcomes will be better for patients as a result of this change. Okay, thank you, Neil. I'm going to go now to Councillor O'Reilly. Thomas O'Reilly, WebEx, please. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us on the on the call and in the chamber tonight. Uh, can I uh, put a few specific questions? Uh, the first question uh, is the Anaskalan SWA Hospital a certified training hospital? And if so, uh, uh, can it uh, not entice young doctors in there to be able to train that we would maybe have a cadre of people coming through so that in in the longer term i appreciate that there uh the second question then uh is there any other service within swa that is under threat or understaffed that would uh in the uh immediate to to medium term uh require a temporary close or a temporary withdrawal. And I appreciate, Neil, that uh, you are saying that uh, you have done everything uh, to try and recruit. I, like Dr. Varma, was uh, involved from a, a civic point of view on the design element of the new hospital SWA when it was being built. And I was a councillor at that time, as well as I am today. And the problem we had at the old Urn Hospital was attracting the clinicians. 
and I am on record to say that the new hospital, whatever was going to be built at the time, would be a fine physical building. But unless we got the clinicians into that building, we would still be struggling to provide the service. We are some amount of years later in that position. So if I recognize that and many others, including uh, yourself and your predecessors would have recognized that and to go out and just ask to recruit and not get in the post filled. Uh, it's the height of madness. It, can you outline to us what the trust has asked the department over and above? Uh, the normal procedure of locally, nationally and internationally advertising posts to be able to attract. Because obviously when you're that long advertising and people are not wanting to come, notwithstanding what you've said, and I believe uh, as it is with GPs, that people want to work in the bigger teams. But that's not a revelation that has happened today or last week. So that could have been led in many, many years ago to be able to look at different ways of building a team to be actually uh, able to continue and provide services. Uh, so just look at what different things you have ask the department to be able to be granted dispensation to do. And the last question, I appreciate that you have just sort of referred to it in your last response, Neil, but at the start, you were pains to point out that you were, and your job is ultimately the accountable, the accounting officer uh, for, the, for the Western uh, Health and Social Service Trust. And as that accounting officer, you are- Can you focus your question, Thomas, because the time's yes. up, but please Ultimately focus- Ultimately responsible for uh, providing a safe service. So we would like to hear from yourself, not just the clinicians, that you can give us the guarantee as accounting officer that that service is safe. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Neil? Okay, for first of all, can I talk to in terms of what we've asked the department to do? As an organisation, we've been flagging up the, the, the challenges in relation to general surgery since 2016, but particularly in 2018 and 2020. We called, this, uh, as a result of our early alert in 2020, the, the Permanent Secretary called all uh, trusts together for us a regional summit in relation to emergency surgery in Southwest Acute Hospital. As a result of that, each trust was, to, was instructed to as, assign general surgeons to come in and work in the Southwest Acute Hospital. However, as a result of what uh, Brendan, Ronan and Mark have outlined to Council tonight, that will no longer be possible. The feedback from those consultants was that they were concerned in relation to how isolated they were in relation to the, what's called the undifferentiated intake in an emergency rota. And I'll invite Brendan to expand on that and also address your question in relation to medical training. Thank you. So I think we do have to put things into perspective. There, it's not just the Southwest Acute that is struggling to recruit. There's actually a huge workforce challenge all across Northern Ireland and across the UK as well, to the extent that the Royal College of Physicians, which is primarily looking at medical doctors, estimated that 48% of consultant posts advertised last year remain unfilled. So that gives you an idea of what we're up against. Now, part of the problem is you have to remember as a trust, we can work within the trust. We cannot change training. We cannot change what happens on a regional basis. We cannot change what happens on a national basis. We can try our best to recruit staff to work in our hospitals and we welcome people. Actually, I one of my roles was, I, I, I was the head of international recruitment. So I personally managed to get some surgeons from uh, the Middle East some from Egypt, and we've welcomed multiple staff, especially in our oncology unit, from across the world. So we have been really open and well ahead of the rest of Northern Ireland in recruiting doctors from outside of the traditional pathways. But, but quite honestly, we, we've come to the end of the line with regards to recruitment. The reason we are where we are today, and I, I'll refer back to it, what, once we get to early February, we will have zero substantive consultants in the Southwest Acute. You cannot provide a service 
beside permanent consultants. We've tried our best. We've tried everything that is within our power that we can do. And while we can talk about what may have been done differently in the past, that's outside of our control. So I, I hope that's a reasonable answer to your question. Uh, Chair, I wonder, could I come in on the back of that as well, if that's okay? Yep. Um, Chair, um, Neil has mentioned the regional summit and I was um, part of the regional summit and obviously with my hat as the chair of the, uh, or the Northern Ireland director of the College of Surgeons, um, was very pivotal in trying to persuade my colleagues to come. Uh, and in terms of Councillor Gannon and Councillor O'Reilly's comments, uh, I can say to them that we did have surgeons um, from all of the district general hospitals coming down to do weekend cover or evening cover. And the, in the process of all of this in the recent months, I asked the same question again, and I got a categorical no. And we live in a society at the minute where there are inquests and inquiries, uh, and my surgical colleagues felt that it was not uh, in their interest to come, no matter what the financial gain that some are talking about tonight, they did not want to come back to the Southwest Acute Hospital to do emergency general surgery. But they have said, and most surgeons in Northern Ireland have agreed, that we need to travel. Um, if our patients need to travel for elective surgery, with that number of people waiting for elective surgery, then we as surgeons need to travel again. But elective surgery is a different situation to emergency general surgery. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Chair, I want to answer. Neil, again, no problem. Before I come to Councillor Keenan. Chair, there was Can two, two you of my questions. I'd answer, answer the final question that Thomas had. Okay, please do, Neil, and then Thomas, if you have time. You've raised the issue down. about safety of services, uh, Councillor O'Reilly, uh, and as accountable officer of the Trust, I am responsible for the delivery of safe services to the people who, who use our services. In this, I am supported by a team of, direct, of executive directors, my medical director, director of nursing, midwifery and AHPs, and director of social work, who have particular responsibilities to assure governance and safe practice, and my wider Trust leadership team all who are on this call tonight, uh, who operate within a risk management assurance framework, which is designed to identify, mitigate and manage risk. The sustainability and continuing safe operation of a general surgery service in the Southwest Acute has been identified as a key corporate risk for the Trust since 2018 to 20. That risk has been centred on our ability to have enough general surgeons who can provide the required standard and continuity of care for our patients. That is a risk which was highlighted again by our clinical teams as part of the regional review of general surgery. That review in itself pointed up additional risks with, it, with the SWA general surgery service, and we were not unique in the struggle to sustain emergency general surgery in the West. So hopefully that explains how we operate as an organisation. Chair, thank you. Thank you. Very briefly, Thomas, if you need to, if you don't, I'm moving on. Yeah. No, just the other uh, question, I think it's very pertinent. Is there any other service that is under threat? That's a good question. Thank you. Neil? My belief that that, that, answer, that, that, was, that question was answered in Geraldine's report, to our best of our knowledge, no. Okay. There are no okay. other services affected by this change. Yeah, Chair, that's not what I'm at. That's not what I asked at all. I asked quite clearly: Was there any other service being provided within SWA that uh, is understaffed or would have to uh, be withdrawn or temporary changed? Not a talking about. Uh, I beg your pardon, Councillor Reddy. I was I was not trying to to to, to, to duck the question at all. Uh, I can I assure you, at this stage, there are many areas of the NHS which are under pressure staffing-wise. So, you know, I have already highlighted how disappointed I am coming into post at the number of medical staff, not just in Southwest Acute Hospital, but also in Alton Gavin Hospital. But you've specifically asked me, are there any particular services particularly at risk to, to the similar type of temporary change? And I, I would say, no, there are not at this time. Okay, thank you. Councillor Keenan. Thank you, Chair. Well, first of all, I'd like to touch on uh, some of the financial history of the SWA, as I think it's uh, very relevant. 
Um, £730 million, pounds, or £7.3 billion, is a total that it is estimated to be paid to the private sector over the full life of the PFI contract with the SWA. So after 30 years and in 2042 and £730 million pounds of taxpayers' money, the SWA will still not be in public ownership. Um, the European Healthcare Project will own 39% of it. Interserve will own 36.5% of it. And Allied Irish Bank will own 24.5% of it. So I'd like to ask the Trust what happens when the PFA term is up. Will the aforementioned company sell it on to the highest bidder in the private market? Or will the Western Trust have the finances and the will to buy it and run it under the NHS? And is this recent move to remove the emergency surgeon from the SWA really a genuine failure to be able to recruit surgeons as the Trust claims? And if so, there has not only been poor management, it is a total incompetence in my view. Or is it as many people believe in this county that it's all part of the plan to speed up the transition of the SWA into the complete control of private companies and the run-up to the end of the private finance initiative contract in 2042? So I would like to ask a direct question, and seemingly it's the elephant in the room. Is this part of the thrust or the Department of Health's plan to move the SWA fully over to the private sector? Um, I believe the people that were standing outside this building tonight and the people in this chamber and everybody in the counties of Man and Throne deserve to be told the truth. I think they're sick of half-truths, they're sick of lies, and there's been many, and they're sick of being fed horse manure from unaccountable, faceless decision-makers, whether they be in the Trust or anywhere else. So I'll repeat my questions again. Is this part of the Trust or the Department of Health's plans to move the SWA fully over the private sector under the guise of moving the SWA to an elective a care centre of excellence. And number two, what happens when the PFA term is up? Will the aforementioned company sell it to the highest bidder in the private market, or will the Western Trust have the finances and the will to keep it fully functioning within the NHS? And if they do, um, could they send us on their long-term business plan on how they will finance the purchase of the SWA going forward? And Mr. McGookin, now, those are my two points. I'd like to ask two more, or add two more points. Those are the two questions. Mr. McGookin, you're a public servant, as are the rest of the Trust Board, and that does mean that you're accountable to the people, or you're supposed to be. But your arrogance in the way you've dealt with ourselves as public representatives and the general public on this issue has shown that you may think that you're above being held to account, and your decisions and the Board's decisions are above being questioned by the general public. But there's a grassroots campaign building on this issue to stop your plans to remove acute services from our community. Another one of its intentions is to hold people like yourself to account, and it will give it a damn good go. And just on the information ten seconds, ten seconds. that you give us on the use of private ambulances, I do recall recently watching a documentary called The Dirty War on the NHS by John Pilger, and uh, there was a case where um, a person rang an ambulance, it was a private ambulance, got lost on the way there, got there. Uh, the guy who was in cardiac Thank arrest. You. One second, um, please. And uh, they needed a defibrillator. The private ambulance crowd got out with a second-hand defibrillator they bought and never tested. Uh, the poor man died. Uh, the family took the, the trust to court, won the, the, won the case, and it was found that there was negligence and they were liable for the man's death. So that's just a wee okay. story on the uh, use Thank of Thank you very ambulances. much, Country Keenan, you. for your focused question. Sorry, my other. My, okay, over to you, Neil. Okay. Uh, can I just address the last point uh, first, uh, Chairman, if that's okay? Uh, I want to highlight that our use of private ambulances is not to go out to look for patients and pick them up. This is a transfer, conveyance of patients, hospital to hospital. So everyone who be who be driving a private ambulance will know they're going from the Southwest Acute Hospital to Alton and Gavin or to Craig Avon or, or to a specific hospital. We're not employing private ambulances to pick patients up from their homes, etc. This is just a top up to the core Northern Ireland ambulance service. Uh, so so I want we're not in this just to privatise. And as soon as the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service can confirm that they have the necessary uh, uh, capacity, we will, will not be having uh, a private ambulances for this purpose. And they will be under contract as well, formal contract, to assure you in relation to governance arrangements. In relation to the PFI, to the best of our knowledge, uh, we, we will own the hospital when we come to the end, in 20 years' time when we come to the end of the, of, 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 of the, the PFI uh, period. I want to emphasise it was nothing to do with the Western Trust in relation to the decision to go down the route of the PFI. You know, certainly, as an accountant, 
I recognise your concerns in relation to PFI. However, it is government policy across the UK at that time, uh, and that was approved by the, uh, the relevant minister, uh, who I believe was Barbara de Bruyne at that time. So that was approved uh, as a policy by the Minister of, of Health for Northern Ireland, who was accountable for that decision. And at the time, that was a decision that was meant to, to be the right. Uh, and you're, you're, you're saying that you know, I'm showing arrogance towards this council. I can assure you that is not my intention. If that have come across, then I wish to apologise, Chair, to this council. But I do want to defend my organisation. I have a duty to do that. I have a duty to, to, to defend everyone from the front line up to the chairman of the board. I believe we've acted with honour. I think we've acted in accordance to the law. And sometimes the law does preclude you from being complete, from having the, the openness and communications uh, because you have to operate within the, the consultation regulations. So thank you, Ma Chair. OK. I need to move now to Corridor Padrigino Kelly. Padraig and Kelly, please. Uh, and thank you for the attendance this evening. Um, however, this is a bleak day for the Oma end of Tyrone and indeed the entire Fermanagh area. Um, I did hear the phrase, patients will be better off. How can we preempt this and how can we guarantee this, Ronan? Um, I also wish to ask, how much will these private ambulances cost? This is coming out of the average taxpayer's money, something that they don't even want. And we've seen that from tonight and indeed the outside the town hall. We do see already the demands on the health service. And I'd like to ask, have you explored absolutely every avenue to ensure that this was adequately staffed? Have you thought of adding in any incentives to keep people? Um, I'm a big GA fan myself. All I keep thinking about is if players kept leaving, I would question the integrity of management. I also do similar here. We hear of it being unplanned and a hard decision today, yet a mixed message from those on this call that has been in the making for a while from the DHO, from the Department of Health. So those are my two questions. Um, not satisfied uh, at all, but appreciate the attendance tonight. OK, thanks, Padrigan. And I want to come back briefly to Eamon. I, I wanted to give him another short opportunity to finish off his point. Thank you, Padraig, and Eamon, this is very brief. Thank you, Chair. No, I was actually finished. Just, uh, the first question that I asked wasn't answered. Uh, it was, is this part of the thrust of the Department of Health's plan to move the SWAF fully over to the private sector under the guise of moving it to an elective uh, centre of care of excellence? That question was dodged. Thank you. Apologies. Um, Padraig and uh, Eamon. Okay. Apologies, okay. Councillor Keane. That was not my intention. I, I believed I had answered it by, by the fact that by, at the end of the PFI contract, to the best of our knowledge, the hospital transfers back to our ownership. So therefore, there's no incentive for us to privatise this hospital. I certainly do not wish any way to privatise this hospital. We have to accept during the period when our waiting times are so poor, we have to avail of any opportunities to increase capacity in the short term. However, my ideology is very much as NHS is best. I've, I've given my entire career to working in the NHS. I think the values of the NHS are fantastic and I would expose to them and all everyone in this trust. So I can assure everyone in council there is no, uh, there's no incentive or there's no approach of this trust to try to privatise the South West Acute Hospital. It is a vital cog and a very major machine within Western Trust. OK, Neil, and Padraigin sure. Kelly, Councillor Padraigin's issues need to be addressed now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, in terms of the cost of the private ambulances, we are still formulating that. I'm sure I, I would propose to, to, to provide that information following this meeting to Council, if that's okay. Uh, in yeah. relation to, yeah. uh, we're, uh, you asked the question, will patients be better off? I believe that's been answered by Professor Taylor, by, by Ronan, and indeed by Brendan. Uh, we, have, we have a research there, and I think Brendan has offered to provide that, uh, that analysis. He was going to put it on the chat box, but we were going to provide that separately. In terms of your question to the integrity of management as a result of the turnover of staff, I think Geraldine has described the exit interviews of staff who are, who are leaving the trust. It's got nothing to do with the integrity of management. It's got nothing to do with how much they're being paid. But I go back to Professor Taylor's comments around the role of a general surgeon at the current time in relation to how you attract and retain general surgeons. Uh, the you've mentioned the demands on the NHS. 
uh, and have we done everything we possibly could? I believe we have, and I can look everyone in the eye. I think uh, in that regard, if you look at Geraldine's presentation, it shows you how we've mitigated this risk, how we've tried our best to, to, to attract and retain general surgeons to the emergency rota, and how we've tried to mitigate this change as well, so that we will keep patients safe as, as a result of this change. Thank you. Neil, maybe both of us should just check if Thomas Adele, your colleague, wishes to come in, your Department of Health colleague, wishes to come in on WebEx. Is that the yeah, case, yeah. Thomas? Yes, please, I just want to confirm. Yes, Chair, I just want to confirm that the Department has no in intention to privatise the NHS. Um, the Department want to see more NHS patients in Southwest Acute Hospital and want to work with the Trust to do that. That, that is an absolute want from the Department we're fully committed to. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor O'Coffey. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I want to thank the presenta uh, presenters in particular. I want to thank uh, Mr. Ferguson, uh, who's, who showed great leadership at this time. And, and I actually want to particularly thank Mr. Varmer, who I think educated us all already. Um, Nipe Evans said that the NHS will last as long as there are those with the faith left to fight for it. And I, I want to assure those who are listening that we are going to fight for our NHS, for our local access to services. I have every fibre of my bone and my body. I want to do that. And I know there's plenty like me because this is the, the best thing we have in our society. My father was born in a workhouse and there's many other people like that in this area. We have a right to access uh, basic life-saving treatments. I think that the presentation uh, from the medical professionals has been kind of self-contradictory. Dr. Guckian's swipe, side swipe against myself, I won't comment upon, it was dishonest, but when you strip out all the professorial pomposity and the dishonest mis misrepresentations, what we have really heard is uh, that we've had two different sets of justifications for the stripping out of emergency surgery from Fermanagh so that there will no longer be any emergency surgery either in Fermanagh or in the whole of Tyrone. When you think of that, isn't that a shock? And yet now we're hearing medical professionals telling us that there is no alternative. Tina, there's no alternative. We have to accept that. On one hand, we are told it's necessitated by a staffing crisis. On the other hand, that it is necessary as a step to rationalise emergency provision across Northern Ireland. I do want to question the definition that has been offered by the Trust of Emergency General Surgery, a definition repeatedly, repeated uncritically by the BBC all evening today and almost exclusively formed, formed, uh, focused on stomachs and stomach treatments. This definition directly contradicts that contained on page eight of the Review of General Surgery. And indeed, it contradicts the later assurances that we have been provided that we have been provided about the fact that trauma, children's trauma and the like will not be impacted by the loss of emergency surgery. Emergency surgery is a much broader concept. We are told in regard to trauma, by the way, that SWA can thankfully remain a trauma hospital. Patients can be taken there and stabilized. Is that what's going to happen to our trauma cases for emergency surgery? Do we have a minute left, not stretching it, but I will try to help you. The most honest we've heard is Dr. Mark Taylor, who's basically repeated the arguments contained in the uh, June policy paper, which I understand has prevented the, Southern, uh, the Southwestern Acute Hospital from actually recruiting the positions. But we have four other recruited positions, which must have been authorized. There was a post uh, super uh, new, conf new configuration emergency hospitals, uh, all five of which, by the way, failed this week. So what's that telling us about how it's going to work out? Not too well. There's so much to be, could be said, but the people of Fermanagh should not be the collateral damage to address long-standing elective care uh, waiting lists. Why should we have to pay that price? Why should our community? And we won't. We won't accept this. That's what you have to understand. People are going to stand up for themselves here, and it doesn't matter what happens. We, we cannot accept this because it is the lifeblood of our community that is going to be lost. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Donal. And before I go to Neil for a reply to your comments, Donal, I, before I offer Neil the opportunity to reply, uh, I will take a proposal and a seconder for extending the meeting for half an hour. 
Councillor Armstrong and Councillor Baird were the two that caught my eye first. Okay, so that's agreed, members. Agreed. Okay, Neil, would you like to reply to Councillor Coffey's comments? I will invite um, Brendan to speak in relation to trauma. Brendan, are you okay to speak on that, please? Absolutely. So I, I think we have to be realistic. There are certain aspects of trauma care that we can and will continue to provide in the Southwest Acute Hospital. If you care to look, there are a multitude of reports that comes out from the Northern Ireland Trauma Network. And indeed, uh, there's a trauma uh, audit research network called TARN, and that looks at trauma care across the UK. So people have a conception about trauma, that trauma really is people falling off roofs, people losing a limb, people being involved in high-speed car accidents. The reality is probably a lot less exciting. If you look at the largest number of patients who fulfill the criteria of having sustained major trauma, it's actually a fall from a standing position to the ground. Now, that affects a lot of elderly people. For the simple reason, they're much more likely to get intracranial or brain bleeds. The Southwest Acute will continue to manage these patients and will continue to manage them very well because they have good backup from their anaesthetic and ICU colleagues. They have 24 seven CT scanning and will be able to transfer these patients to Belfast just as we do in Alton Galvin. Thank you. Okay. I'm gonna to go to my next speaker then in the chamber, that being Councillor Feely. Thank, thank you, Chair, and I'd like to thank the Trust for giving us that presentation and for Mr. Ferguson and, 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 and um, Professor Varma, who I, I thought was very interesting in his comments there. And maybe the Trust should just listen to some of his comments, maybe and take some of them on board. Well, I'm one of, one of the councillors that lives, for, I say, the furthest way from Minuscule and Garrison. It's a, it's a good 30 minute drive if you're going quick and, and no traffic on the road if it's busy. and. A foggy night or slippy, you take 30, 35 minutes, and parts of the parish further away, another 10 or 15 minutes. So, we'd be very much affected of these services because it takes that length to get to the skill and let alone go to Derry or um, uh, Acne Galvin. And I heard a, a bit of talk there about Sligo as well. I didn't hear anybody mention Lethe Kenny, but I heard Sligo Hospital mentioned there as well. But it's it'd be probably close to me about 40 minutes. but. I did listen to a kind of a local radio station in at home, Ocean FM, and maybe it covers West Fermanagh and North Sligo, North Leitham, and maybe South Donegal there. And I say in about once or twice a week, they'll be talking about the amount of people on trolleys in Sligo Hospital alone. So they are, are getting it tight to manage their own people without any extra people coming. So I, I, I don't know how that'll work out. An ambulance, like, would, would it be an ambulance from the 26 counties or an ambulance from the six counties that would bring you there? Or what way would that work like? So I don't know, don't think that's worked out or, or thought out at all. But one of the main things I wanted to talk about, and, and, and my, my colleague, Councillor Coyle, touched on it earlier on there, but I just want to get my head around it again and make sure that there's going to be no change to this at all. It's the, it's the, the maternity unit in, in South West. And I'd like, could, could the trust con co commit to the to the access of maternity service would, would be kept in in the southwest and f and further de de developed. For we we definitely need that. And I heard a lot of talk about C sections there, and um, Debbie mentioned it there and said there would be no change in that. But I would be very weary that, and I know the importance of a C section and the speed you have to get it done. With uh, in my own family, I've seen it with the birth of my of my daughter. So I would be very um, worried about that. So I just one question. An expectant mother who needs an emer emergency section will have to be transferred out of the SWA to another hospital to get the treatment. Is that true or is it not? Is it definitely going to be kept on the way it is in the, in, in the SWA because we definitely need it? And that's one big concern I'd have. Like every other council, I'm very worried about the whole developments here. And, and we're, we're all in the fight together. And I've seen that other meeting where the, all the political parties is fighting, the whole community is fighting for it. That's the only good thing we have. But just I'm still. I still want to get my head around it and hear direct again. Is there going to be any impact on the on the maternity or the C-sections? Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Feely. Neil. Well, I can repeat what Geraldine's already said, uh, Councillor Feely, and you know, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to be able to say so. That you know, uh, I think our work in neonatology services is a prime example of where we're determined to keep 
maternity services within Southwest Acute Hospital. It's an example where we highlighted the fragility of, of neonatology services within the hospital. We have worked tirelessly in, over the last 12 months under the leadership of Tom Cassidy, who's here tonight, to actually develop and, and, uh, and improve neonatology services. And we haven't completed that journey yet, but we have a robust governance process to do so. Yes, I can commit that the maternity services will be kept in Southwest Acute Hospital. And both uh, Mark, Brendan, Ronan and Geraldine have outlined the mitigation that we brought in. I can The reason why I can categorically state that is I have invited in the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecology to review the arrangements that we would have in this change. And they have made a number of recommendations, all of which have been implemented by this trust. So we, we are going forward on that basis uh, councillor, and we and we are determined to maintain uh, maternity services in Southwest Acute Hospital. Thank you, Councillor McCann. Okay, thank you, Chair, and I want to thank uh, Neil and his team for joining us tonight. And I recognise that it has been a very difficult day for the trust, but it's also been a very difficult day as well for for the council and the people who we represent. Uh, just tonight, we've all seen about a hundred people outside the outside the town hall as we come in. Who are who are anxious and distressed about what's happening at the Southwest Acute Hospital, and I think that uh, some of that has been down to poor communication. And we've heard about communication tonight, but I think communication in this has been an issue. Uh, we can see, or we have seen, how town halls and community halls in in different areas have been filled to capacity with people who are anxious to hear what's happening. And there's been no communication from from the trust. And I hear what Neil is saying in terms of that about his you know his, his restraints. However, nonetheless, it has it has added to people's distress. You know, communication going forward uh, is very very important. And uh, I think it was Dr O'Hare had mentioned that uh, a robust communication plan going forward. You know, so communication has been an issue, and uh, it needs to be key going forward. Now, I'm not uh, an expert on general surgery by any means. Uh, but I do hear what our people are saying out there in West Throne and across the Fmanloma district, and they generally are concerned. I took a lot of value from, from uh, Professor Varmer's presentation. You know, this man has been involved in attracting services to this area for a long time, and what he said makes sense to me. You know, uh, okay, yes, there's, a, there's issues recruiting uh, specialists and consultants across, across these islands. That term has been used. But I believe firmly that if the will is there, the genuine will is there at that high level to bring people to Fmanaloma, that can be done. We've heard about work uh, salaries and all the rest, and, but people, you know, people now are talking more about work-life balances and, you know, uh, Fmanaloma is one of the best places to live on the island of Ireland, you know, and I don't accept that everything has been done to attract uh, the people that we need to Fmanaloma. I think that, you know, people you know, that this area offers a lot and could offer a lot. And with the genuine will and, incent and incentives, you know, a lot more could be done to bring to bring people here. Chair, I'm just going to finish, you know, I've, I've, so I've, I've one question really in round a uh, gynecology and it's been touched on tonight, but I'm just not getting the answer and waiting on. Uh, I'd imagine that the theatres in the SWA are quite busy with paternity related surgery, you know, and I heard that, I think it was Geraldine had said that that is not carried out under the banner of general emergency surgery. But at some stage or other, and I've, and I've experienced this in the past myself, you know, during a cesarean, it's quite a significant operation, things can go wrong. A bowel can be can be nicked, I think, and bladders and, and stuff can can be damaged. At what stage does it become a general emergency? And what happens in that case? You know, take me through what happens. Is that patient looked after in-house? Or is that patient stitched up? Now, pardon, you know, I'm not being disrespectful, or but is that patient stitched up and transported to somewhere else to get the surgery finished? You know, can we get that uh, assurance? And just before I finish up, Chair, I want to read a text I received from a fella uh, who lives very close to here, who recently had an experience of having to go to the SWA for for a serious treatment or you know, treatment for Please a serious illness. Stephen. Yeah, uh, on asking him how he was, he says, "Getting there, hopefully, Stevie, but still very weak." I would like you, if you would add my voice to the great care and attention and medical professionalism that I was given in the SWA, and I would very strongly disagree with the downgrading of services there. I know if I hadn't had that facility and care, I might not be here to talk about it. I really owe all of the staff 
there from consultants to attendants and the cleaning staff, as well as the nurses, a massive appreciation. And I believe it would be wrong for the people of this area to be deprived of such care and service. You know, people, people outside matter, people who I represent in West Tyrone matter, you know, and I think we do all deserve a bit better. Okay, thank you. Neil? Okay, I'll, I'll start and then I'll ask Brandon to talk about the, the clinical aspects of a genuine emergency and, and Ronan, I'm sorry, and uh, uh, Mark will come in as well about attracting doctors. In terms of the genuine emergency, I want to reassure Council, uh, and it's linked to the Royal College visit that we had. We have, in, we have supplemented the rota for middle grade doctors. And what does that mean? For a lay person like myself, that means an experienced, qualified doctor will be on site to give a surgical opinion and support to colleagues in such a circumstance that you raise. But Brendan will say things much more eloquently than me. And you have suggested that if the will is there, we will attract uh, doctors. This isn't about money. I will go back to Geraldine's comment where she's spoken to people who are leaving and Mark's comments about attracting people in. It's not about work, uh, money. It's not about work-life balance. I can assure you the job of a general surgeon in emergency rota in Southwest Acute will not attract general surgeons. In terms of uh, the feedback that you gave about downgrading of uh, Southwest Acute Hospital, I want to reiterate, this is not a downgrading of the hospital. That's not right. I do want to thank your constituent for the kind comments in relation to the staff in Southwest Acute, and, I appreciate, and that is much appreciated. And please pass back my thanks for that, and also my wishes for a full recovery to your constituent. In relation to communications plan, I fully accept that communications from the trust have been restricted, and I, we will address that going forward. So, uh, and that, there's a number of reasons for that, which I will not, which I have already explained. But I think it's most important for council to know we will com uh, consult and we will communicate here on in. I do want to pass over uh, to Brendan now in relation to the to the maternity case and, and genuine uh, emergencies. Thank you, Chair. Okay, so following on from that, a bowel injury would be a very rare complication of a cesarean section. It is more likely, even though it's still a rare occasion, that you're more likely to have a bladder injury. Now, with regards to the specific treatments of those, I'm gonna hand over in a minute to Professor Taylor. He's the only consultant surgeon in the room, and I think it's best that he gives you an answer. But it is important to realize, and we've stated this before, we do have 24 seven experienced middle grade surgical staff available to come in if there are any surgical problems out of ours for any problems during an emergency cesarean section. Mark, can you comment please? Yeah, and I think it's a really important question. Um, and again, uh, I can give you my experience as a general surgeon working in Belfast um, with the Royal Maternity Hospital, um, seeing and dealing with the largest number of cesarean sections in Northern Ireland. Uh, and the injury to bowel during a cesarean section is a very, very uncommon injury. The second issue about bowel injuries and bowel surgery is that um, whilst that is a surgical emergency, clearly it's a surgical emergency, that it's not just the surgery that is the management of the patient. It is the resuscitation of the patient with fluids, with antibiotics. Uh, and, and no matter where you are in Northern Ireland, at times you will have to wait to get the surgery. But that doesn't equate to an abnormal or an, uh, uh, an adverse outcome. Um, quite the contrary, it is the diagnosis of it, it is the picking it up at an early stage that is critical. But these are all very important conversations. And I actually uh, wanted to come back to, to Councillor Coffey. I think he made some very um, important points and I, I'm grateful to him for reading uh, the Review of General Surgery document be because that in the round is about providing um, general surgery, no matter where you live in Northern Ireland. And I can hear the people of Tyrone and Fermanagh tonight saying and yearning for the same access to services as anywhere else. And that's exactly why we produced a review of general surgery, because it is that exact factor. It is that everyone gets the same level of care. 
now in the fullness of time uh, and and again i would encourage everyone not to be discouraging of the overnight stay centers because that overnight stay center will put surgeons into south tyrone or into into um the southwest acute hospital that that would not normally have been there and it is an amazing facility and similar to my own experiences in the matter hospital it is a community it is a family the theater nurses the porters the domestics and we lost a lot of identity many years ago in terms of losing emergency surgery in the matter but we gained in terms of the hepatobiliary service even though we weren't doing emergency surgery but the presence of the surgeons in the building will be the key in the development of the review of general surgery the elective surgeons will be there to provide the support to ED, the support to the other medical disciplines. And what we have to do and what the Western Trust are doing at the minute is mitigating in this unplanned way until such times as we can furnish surgical presence back into the Southwest Acute Hospital. And whether emergency surgery comes back to the Southwest Acute Hospital or not, there still has to be a surgical presence. And that is what the Review of General Surgery wants to do in the same way as Daisy Hill Hospital, Causeway Hospital uh, and the like will still have a general surgical presence. OK, now, members, you know, there's 15 minutes left. I have a duty to allow full speaking time till three members who have not yet spoken and who are about to speak. And but I might take them, if you didn't mind, three minutes three minutes three minutes and then if the trust team can give a composite response to the three spoken contributors and they're going to be in this order here they're going to be in the order of john coyle emmett mcgillier paul stevenson each councillors so councillor coyle over to you straight away thank you chair um as many other councillors have said it's uh it's a sad day, it's a hard day for the Trust, it's a hard day for the Council, but uh, I know that the meeting started off in a very kind of aggressive tone uh, and uh, I won't be apologising for standing up for my constituents. Um, we had a meeting in Balik last night and uh, heard of a story that uh, a man would have lost his wife and child only for SWA and uh, yes, the obstetricians was there, but uh, I think there was a major bleed and general surgeons had to come in and save the lady's life. Uh, from the feel of the room last night, uh, we found out that uh, we are not going to be treated like second class citizens in uh, rural Fermanagh and Oma. We will probably be the only council that has no dual carriageway and uh, we will have no specialists in uh, you know, general surgery. Yes, we will have middle grade uh, surgeons that will help and provide uh, from neonate or for maternity services but uh, it is when we need the service we need the specialists and i think that's vitally important uh, two questions or a statement i know that staff in ward three and nine of the hospital has been treated shambolically uh, with no um, notification very little communication with them uh, I think that the Trust needs to uh, step up and support staff. Uh, it is difficult for them, it is difficult for our community, and uh, we need to uh, really show we have to do everything together. And I have always said to Neil and the senior staff of the Western Trust that I will work in partnership, but I do feel that this has damaged our relationship. Uh, and that, uh, you know, this uh, a question is about the temporary closure. Is that for two months? Is it for three months? There's no time frame. It's a year. It could be two years. It could be five years. It's totally unacceptable. Um, and if the trust can provide us with a time frame. Uh, and the other thing was that from January 22, there was uh, jobs put out but nothing was done since then. And I need answers on, uh, you know, over the last month, why have we uh, such a recruitment now? Okay. Eight months has passed. Thanks, John. Emmett? 
Councillor McNair. Good morning. Carlock, yeah, I'd start by thanking the two gentlemen up at the top table for taking the time and effort to come in tonight, and their input has been invaluable. Um, I appreciate they haven't had much chance to input further into the meeting, and I would be inclined to propose that we maybe invite them back to an informal meeting of the Council at a later date to get some further input for them, because the input has been invaluable. Chair, mindful of the time, I was going to pose the question to those that are dialing in tonight, if they're aware of the definition of health and equality by the King's Fund, which is the superior body on health, but I'll read it out here. Health and equalities are avoidable, unfair and systematic differences in health between different groups of people. As such, how can the Trust allow matters to reach this level with such discrimination between areas? And that's even comparing, comparing uh, patients in the SWA area and patients in Alton Galvin, but even more so in terms of fighting rural communities against urban communities. This sh there should be an equality and it's never been reached. It's never reached the required standard. I think there's undue um, excitement around the elective surgery element of this whilst trying to brush aside or ignore the major impact this is going to have in communities and in, in the local community here. The issue is being presented as one of recruitment and retention. Why is this? Better, uh, if, there, if there is a recruitment and retention issue, as the trust claim, then why, many would ask why there's no HR manager here to explain that failure, and indeed ask the question, who is being held responsible? Or is this, as has been alluded to, an engineered crisis? And I note that Dr. Tom Black has just blamed the decision on a failure to develop and implement an effective workforce strategy. We've heard speakers talk about how long this has been an issue. Seemingly nothing has been done on it. And that, to me, is a failure of management. So I would again uh, call on the, and repeat the call made from this council in terms of the, the letter we issued on the 10th of November, that the council has no confidence in the board of the trust and that we request that all members resign their position. They've done nothing tonight to change my mind in relation to that. Furthermore, Chair, and I'm again mindful of the time that I'm limited on what to speak on, the point raised uh, by members in front of me in relation to the legal challenge and the legal ground, to my mind, they're on very dodgy ground here and without, prejudices, without prejudice, prejudice, looking back at the, a previous challenge against another department, which was signed off without a minister, and this claim that labelling something as temporary without any defined time frame. To me, that doesn't stand up. And again, I would call on the Council to proceed, and I know this is an item for later discussion, that we proceed with our legal action as a matter of urgency, Chair. All I've heard are excuses, uh, pushes to privatise elements of the NHS, and unfortunately, once those dominoes start falling, it's a long road back. We've witnessed in recent times the dangers of privatisation within this Council, the effect that's having. And again, in terms just to conclude here, Look Chair. Your time's well up. Just Please, final point. The, the, the Chief Executive there spoke in terms of staffing and provision west of the ban. And I would like to know, you know, what has proactively, I haven't heard examples of what proactively has been done to counter this. And indeed, how does the stripping out of more health provision in this area assist with the benefit to the local community? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And finally, Councillor Stevenson. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, we've been hearing all night this has been unplanned, yet you could say that uh, from February 2019 they've had three retired. You know, surely retirement age just didn't happen in the last few months. I would have liked to have thought that they would have been planning before this, like, and uh, to do something about it. Um, the one thing that hasn't really been talked about here tonight is that actually the family of the patients, the travelling that they may have to do if uh, services to, is taken to Alton Galvin or Craig Alvin. You know, uh, with the cost of living at this minute in time, uh, it's, a, it's a big ask. You know, and my late father, who I spent three years caring for, had spent several nights, well, several weeks in the hospital, nine weeks at one stage, you know, and he was under 24 hour care where we had to look for him, feed him, and, and do what we had to do. So, I mean, like, if surgery is happening within Alton Galvin and Craig Alvin, are the patients then transferred back to SWA to recuperate, or will they be kept up in the, the hospitals? That's all I have to ask. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Paul. Okay, Neil, over to you for composite response. 
Okay, in relation to your Councillor Corey, uh, the need to support staff and speaking to staff and particularly Ward 3 and Ward 9. I was on Ward 3 and Ward 9 speaking to staff on Friday uh, to reassure them that we need every single one of those staff. We met with Ward 3 and Ward 9 staff again today to reassure them that every one of them is needed. Ward 9 is a, an elective ward. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, they are actually excited by this change because there will be opportunity for them to go right back to the core responsibility that they have. Ward 3, is they, the staff in Ward 3 are concerned, quite rightly, and we have, we've reassured them today, and we're working through the implications for Ward 3 in the coming days and weeks. In relation to uh, HR and recruitment and retention, we do have an HR manager. We have an HR director in our presence sitting next to me now. Uh, Karen Hargan is here. Uh, to account for the recruitment process. However, you have heard from Professor Taylor, you've heard from Brendan Lavery, you've heard from Ronan O'Hare, you've heard from Geraldine Mackay. Everyone is saying the same thing. It is extremely difficult to attract general surgeons to an emergency route in a hospital such as Southwest Acute Hospital. Uh, in relation to, uh, I'm trying to look down here to see uh, what any other... Yes, in terms of uh, the health inequality uh, discussion, I would want to highlight, this was discussed today with staff as well, following the decision of Trust Board today, and I want to say one of the outcomes from this will be the standardisation of waiting times amongst the Western Trust area. So at the moment, there's the potential, because there are two different clinical teams, to have differential waiting times for populations in the northern sector and populations in the southern sector. That will be eradicated by this change, uh, and, and the move to common waiting times will eradicate that element of health inequalities. So we believe we're moving forward to address health inequalities by making this stand. We're not brushing aside the impact in that regard. Uh, in relation to the privatisation, Chairman, I have on record very strongly against any hint of prior pri privatisation. We will use the private sector where it's in the best interest to, for patients, and particularly in the short term, to increase capacity. And we have done that extremely successfully regarding uh, the Musgrave House arrangement in the Southwest Acute Hospital, which has transformed the treatment of hips in Northern Ireland. Um, uh, and I would commend that to every member today. Chairman, I'm coming to the end of a very long night. Uh, this is the second long session we've had with Council. Uh, I know this is difficult. I'm not here to try to say we want to do this change. I don't want any of my answers to be misconstrued in that regard. This is us reacting to an extremely difficult situation we find ourselves in. Some people have, have said that there are ulterior motives in this. I can assure you, the comment we've made there, we knew about retirements, why didn't we plan? I can assure you all our retirements, we had planned for them and we replaced those consultants. These are unplanned resignations, not retirements. So, and we are now have to look at these rules and why can we not attract people to rules like this? Professor Taylor has outlined why, Ronan O'Hare has outlined why, Brendan Lavery has outlined why, and Geraldine Mackay has outlined why we have, we have difficulty and failed to recruit. So that is why we've gone from tw January 22 to, the re to, the, to now in terms of no recruitment. A lot of that time, I believe, was spent negotiating with the Royal College to try to allow us to recruit. This is not like the private sector where you can go out and just uh, advertise for a post. We have regulations that we must follow and the Royal College have to approve every consultant post job plan and they are part of the panel as well. So folks, a final, final comment. Can I just say Southwest Acute Hospital remains open for business. Southwest Acute Hospital is an incredibly safe environment. We are determined to give it a very bright future. If we all work together, I <coughs> think we will be in a better chance to make that a uh, reality. So thank you for everyone's time tonight. Okay, thank you, Neil, and your team, uh, your colleagues from the Western Trust and also the Department of Health. Um, and obviously, we have much to reflect on and we'll be in touch. And uh, so as you take your leave from the meeting, we're going to deal with two remaining items very, very quickly. Uh, and thanks to the Trust and the Department once again. We'll be in touch. Thank you, Chair. Thank you to everyone. Okay. So, Members, I just want to propose her and a seconder now to note to note the correspondence in item six. So I've got Paul Robinson.
proposing to note that. Have we got a seconder? Councillor McCann, thank you very much. Um, not going to deal with any urgent and relevant business, but I do want to give some time to item eight on the agenda. It would be wrong not to, wouldn't it? Um, it is part two of the meeting. It is the confidential matters section and matters exempt from publication according to the legislation. So we're about to hear item eight in confidential session. Um, so I'd like to thank those who are in attendance uh, throughout the meeting this evening. But we just need the remaining minutes now to deal with this item in confidential matters. I need a proposer and seconder to go into confidential matters, Diana and Tommy. Uh, Diana Armstrong and Tommy McGuire. Okay, and we'll take a brief pause. And uh, thanks, Donald. Thank
Fair play D is red. John Spillan, fair play. Okay, good to go. I'll hand over to the Chief Executive towards the conclusion of the meeting and after coming out of confidential matters. Thank, you very, thank you very much, Chair. Just to advise that while in confidential matters, uh, members received a verbal update on the legal advice that's been previously sought by the Council and have agreed some further actions in relation to that, which we will report on in due course to members. Okay, thanks very much, Chief Executive. And the meeting has ended. Proposer and seconder, Victor and Roy.